some boards up at um, my um, ex-boss's or my boss's place. And, um, oh my gosh, I've got boards flying all over the place. Fabulous. I mean, I'm going to have a ton of boards. <laughs> I planted those um, miniature corn. Uh huh. I planted those too, also. So those are doing real. Good. And then, of course, my husband's got his field. He's got chili and corn and melons yeah. and beans and. Wow. I don't yeah, know I what. Yeah, I planted green beans. Huh? String, I planted string beans. Green oh. beans. Oh. Yeah, these are the regular, well, they're the pinto beans. Yeah. And those are good when, when they're fresh. I guess Almost, we're okay. We're getting closer. <laughs> yeah, that one year he, um, I asked to plant some squash at, the, at his field. And um, anyway, uh, you know how the squash gets um, those pl bugs on oh, there? The squash beetles. The squash oh. beetles. They ate all the squash, all his watermelon yeah. started getting into his oh, chili. They're horrible. And so he told me, never am again am I going to plant squash for you again. Do you know what my friend, my neighbor, the farmer said? You plant squash after the 1st of July. Uh huh. Ron? Mm -hmm. We're on. We're on. Oh my goodness. Isn't that wonderful? Did you send the email? Yes. Oh, good, good. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry we're a little bit late, but technical difficulties. The email, I mean, excuse me, the computer decided it was going to update in the middle of the night. And uh, as a result, we had to sort of start all over again this morning. But uh, I'm Andrea Fisher. This is Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery, and we are in the process of featuring 27 of our favorite potters over the month of August for a live demonstration. And the reason that we're doing this is because Indian Market, of course, this year was canceled. And I have no idea what, oh, Indian market this year was canceled. And as a result, uh, we have a large, large group of people who make their living by selling at Indian market. A lot of the potters uh, depend on Indian market as a major source of their income. And some of them, it's the only income they have at all. And Consequently, without Indian market, uh, many of them are left in dire straits. Uh, so what we're trying to do here today is bring a little bit of the market to you, but in a way that is a little bit different because we have the potters here. We will have the potters here, and you should check out on our website what the schedule is for the, uh, the next couple of weeks. There'll be We'll be up and going probably a little better than we are today since this is the first day. Uh, but we'll be up and going Tuesdays through Saturdays for the entire month of August. And we may even go a little bit into September as well. But uh, today uh, we have Ruby Panana from Zia Pueblo. And you know, the reason, like I said before, the reason that we're doing this is that so we can support the potters in every way possible and that the continuation of American Indian pottery can be guaranteed because once the market goes away, the potters go away too and find unemployment other places. And so we're here today with Ruby. Ruby has been making pottery for quite a few years. Uh, she's from Zia Pueblo, and... Uh, Hi! <laughs> there she is waving. Let me just tell you a few things about her. Uh, she's from Zia Pueblo, but she lives at Jemez. 
and she works in the Zia style. Um, Seferina Bell, who was an extremely well-known potter, um, is Ruby's mama, and that's where she learned how to make pottery. Uh, after being in, in high school and then in college and, and wanting to continue her studies and be a teacher, uh, there wasn't enough finances to go around. And she came back to, uh, to Zia Pueblo, and that's when Mama taught her to make pottery. By that time, she was, you know, in, in her late 20s, early 30s, and uh, was ready to go. But anyway, we have Ruby here today. We also have um, Ruby's pieces. All the pieces will be for sale. They will have prices marked on them. Uh, they will be available on our website, if not right this minute, very, very shortly. Uh, and we will take care of um, purchasing them, uh, for you pur to purchase them here at the gallery. The whole staff is here right now. This is my fourth day back since, since mid-March. And, but the whole staff is here today. We're all sanitized, we're all masked, and we are living in New Mexico with a fabulous governor who is trying to keep us controlled and under wraps so that we all don't get sick and die. Hallelujah, thank you. And um, um, we have Calvin, who's downstairs. He's the person who's gonna be packing. Al and um, Amy and Erica will be the ones helping you either online or over the phone if you wish to purchase something. And Scott, who is our, con our computer guru, he's the one who's going to take care of all the problems if we have more than we've already had so far. And Derek, my son, and my partner, he's our movie director. And so, uh, if you, this is, you know, a little bit that you know about us. Uh, after 27 years in business and doing business in a very, very standard retail sort of way, we are now um, invading the technical world. So without any further ado, what I'd like to do is I would like to introduce you to Ruby Panana from Zia Pueblo. Hi, I'm Ruby. Uh, I've been um, doing pottery for 38 years now. Um, I learned from my mother, Safrina Bell, as Andrea Fisher told you. Um, I, well, I've been doing 30, pottery for 38 years full time. Um, I used to do them when I was a small child. Um, my mom used to give us a little pieces of clay and we'd make little miniatures that she'd paint and we'd take them down to the bridge there in Zia and sell them for 50 cents each. And every time we sold the pot, we'd run home to mom and tell her that we sold the piece and she'd tell us, okay, go back and sell some more. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've enjoyed doing pottery, it relaxes me, and, you know, I tell people I don't need anything else to get high, just the smell of clay, the earth, smell, it's, you know, like, it's really good, it smells good and everything, and um, today I'll be demonstrating on how to make a pot, how I make pots, and also I'll be demonstrating on how I polish and paint my pottery. And I've got samples of the materials that I use, all my paints and all my clays and stuff like that that I use. So today I'll start, I don't know if you can see me, but I'll start by making a pot and this is the way we start we why, why do you smack it like that 
like that, Ruby. To get a lot of the um, air bubbles out, so try to get as much air bubbles out of there. And if there are any air bubbles in the pot, what, what happens? Um, if it's a large air bubble, it'll make it um, pop, but the smaller ones, it'll like put little pits, holes in there. And as I go, when I'm smoothing the pot out, it'll, um, the little bubbles will show up. So I, I can, you know, pretty much take all the bubbles out and everything like that. So my clay, it's a red, red clay. And um, I use a temper, it's called um, basalt rock. And um, is it all right if I get up? Get the, sure. Okay. This is the form that I use get get the rocks out. This is the way I get them out. They're rocks. They're soft, and um, I break them down and grind them down. And this is how fine I have to get them. This like a powder in order to mix with my clay. And that acts as a temper for my clay. So my, because if I just use the raw clay by itself, it'll crack. It won't stay together. It'll just crack all over. So we need a temper in there. And that, that's my temper. So... Do, anyway, do, do you know of other Pueblos, do they use the same temper or different ones? Um, no, everybody else has their own temper. Um, I know some Pueblos use, um, what do you call that? The um, volcanic ash. Mm -hmm. And um, it's like a white sand but ours is a rock, and with ours, it, um, since we use like a rock form, it causes our pottery to be waterproof. And because um, when we fire it, if a piece breaks, you'll see a, like in the middle of the clay, um, there'll be like a, almost like a thin layer of rock that formed in inside the clay. And so that causes it to be wa waterproof. And then all our paints are all natural. I use all my paint uh, made from different clays, um, sand, um, everything's all natural. And so, um, that also causes it to be waterproof. We don't use any commercial paints or nothing like that. It sounds to me, you know, like you need to be a chemist. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, you got to have muscle in order to do my do pottery. <laughs> now, now you did your own clay. Yes. And where do you go to do the clay? I do we have a couple of clay pits there in Zia Pueblo. It's up on the side of the hill. You have to climb climb up to the hill and um, we usually get them in um, like 5 gallon buckets and we haul them back down to our vehicle. There's no road where we can just drive up to it. We have to climb up there. I usually depends on how tired I am because you got to dig it up and then put it in the buckets and um, climb it up and down that hill. I'll get maybe three, four buckets at a time. And I usually stock up on all my materials during the, mostly spring, when the 
ground thaws out, I stock up all my material before all the snakes come out because I'm terrified of snakes. <laughs> I don't care if it's a garden snake, I will run. <laughs> so anyway, but um, I stock up on everything during the springtime. And um, so, you know, I, I make several trips during the spring to go get clay and um, all my materials. And um, um, so I keep a, like, a, like a big supply of materials to last me for a while. And what are you doing there? This one I'm forming the bottom of the bowl, the um, pottery. This is the way we, after I formed the ball, I um, beat it. <laughs> and start forming the bowl. And this will go into uh, another bowl, like a ceramic bowl, a puki. Some of them have um, regular clay, clay bowls that they use for doing their pottery on. So, so I've, a puki is uh, a form in which you can, which you start these. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, just for the bottom, just to have a, like a um, solid form or something in order to um, hold your pot up, because otherwise if I just put it there by itself, then it'll fall apart. It'll just cave in. So what I'm doing is getting it ready to put it into the pookie. It is my utensils, they're butter knives, and um, I used to use um, boards as my smoother, but they would wear out so fast, so I went and found an old cup that was almost the shape of a what you call it, and I formed this one. And I've had this for maybe about 20 years yeah. now. <laughs> so. So with that um, kitchen knife that you were using, you know, 300 years ago, there probably weren't too many kitchen knives. No. <laughs> what was it that you used then? Uh, they would use um, like gourds and. Um, Mostly gourds is what they would use, or sticks or something like that. That's what they used to use. So anyway, I've got my clay in the bowl. And I don't know if you can see me, but I'm... Oh yeah, they can see just great. Yeah, I'm forming the shape of my pot here. And then after I do this, then I'll do start my coil work. I um, form coils and build three at a time. And then I'll smooth it out and I'll keep keep building it up like that with the coils. So, anyway, after I finish building, and then as, as you can see, I don't have a wheel. This old pizza pan is my wheel, so my bowl can turn smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, you know, I uh, when I was younger, when I was in high school, I tried throwing pottery on a wheel. I could not get get the hang of it. 
Ah, to go back to my old ways. <laughs> well, what's uh, truly amazing is that you see an old pizza pan and a broken cup and a, um, and a kitchen knife, an old yeah. kitchen knife, uh, and then you see what the final product is. And it's really, really, truly amazing. Uh, earth that comes from the ground, rocks that you grind up, and you wind up with an incredible piece of art. You know, I'm still mystified about how that all comes together. Now, when yeah. you dig that clay, uh, it, um, what about all the other stuff that's in it, like weeds and twigs and seeds? Oh. And what, what do you do? How do you get it to the point where you can okay. use it? Okay, when um, I get my clay, when I dig my clay out, when I get home, I let it completely dry because a lot of times it'll be just damp from coming out of the ground. I let it dry and then I break it down and um, I'll grind it um, on the matate. And, um, so a stone grinder with a st another stone? Yeah. Uh-huh. And um, anyway, I'll grind it down until I get it into a real fine powder and then I'll sift it through a real fine sifter Mostly it's um, an old curtain, uh, you know, like a silk curtain or something like that that I'll use to sift through. And then whatever doesn't go through that fine sifter, then I'll soak that and then I'll strain it again so that way I don't waste any of my clay. Uh, you know, I... I'm one that doesn't believe in wasting clay. And it sounds like it's so hard to come by, going up and down the hill. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, um, I taught a young man from Zia how to do pottery. And when we first started, you know, doing pottery, I told him that clay was very precious to me. And he didn't understand what it meant, what I meant by you know, clay was precious to me. And later on, when he started doing pottery on his own, then he realized that, you know, you've got to use every bit of clay. You can't be wasteful. Even when I'm scraping my pottery, all the powder that comes out of the um, pottery, I save all that and um, I clean it again and I remix it, so that way I don't waste clay. So it's very precious to me, you know, because it's such hard work to be going up and um, digging the clay yourself. And, um, um, you know, it's, it's just hard work. Now, when, when you dig this clay, are there any religious um, things that happen uh, that's involved in, in, take, in, in stealing this clay from Mother Earth? Yes, we usually say our prayers. We um, take our core meal with us and we talk to Mother Earth and tell her we, we're going to um, take part of her, um, um, how can I say it, um, her stomach or something. And, and then um, and then after we finish, then we, after we, because we cover the clay back up, we cover the clay back up, but before we do, we put some food in there for the clay, for the mother earth to feed her, so that way she can replenish the clay. So we have to go through all that procedures in order to get our clay. You know, same thing with everything else. We take our temper, our paints, everything. We have to, re, you know, pray to, to Mother Earth and to give us the clay part of herself in order for us to use in our pottery. Wow. So, anyway, but I've formed the bowl, the bottom of my pot, and now I'm going to start coiling. 
And the way I usually do that is I get a ball of clay and I roll it out like a coil and then I'll, I usually have my tarp here, then I'll roll it out as long as I can get it in the size of the coil that I want. And then I'll start pinching it onto the bottom of my form here. I'll start pinching it together and start building my pot up. And I'll do this, I'll keep this till the side, I, you know, um, however big I want my pot. And, you know, the pots, it, the sizes depends on the uh, form that I use, the uh, pookie. Uh, I've got different sizes. The bigger they are, the bigger your pot is. You know, I've got another size here, which is kind of like a medium size for a medium size pot. And I've got one pookie that belonged to my grandmother. Okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. So anyway, I'll just keep continually coiling it. I'll coil it, put like three, four coils on, and then I'll smooth it up and then keep coiling up. And, um, and then when I get to the top, to the size I want, then I'll um, shape it. And um, then I'll let it sit for a couple of hours. Because I, what I do is I kind of build my pottery kind of straight up. And then after it sits and hardens a little bit, then I go back in and I stretch it to shape it the way I want it. Do you ever poke holes through it? Oh, oh yeah, plenty <laughs> of times. <laughs> I remember my daughter that one time, she was like three years old, and um, anyway, I was making one of my larger pieces, like this one behind me. I had it sitting there, I had just finished making it, and she came screaming with her finger pointed out, and I said, oh no! And she went straight for my pot and put a hole right in the middle of the pot. And I thought, it's going to fall in. And uh, miraculously, it didn't fall in. <laughs> and I was able to um, patch it back up and it stayed up. Well, does your daughter make pottery now? Uh, she knows how I taught her how to do it, but right now she's busy. She's a nurse, um, so she really doesn't have the time. So I'm hoping one of these days that she'll go back to making pottery. Well, it took you a while to get going, so oh, yeah. Yeah, there's still hope. <laughs> there's still yeah. hope. known each other Ruby oh gosh it's, it's been a long time long time, time long it's time it's like 20 something years well I've had the gallery for 27 years yeah and did I know you when I was at the museum uh no you were no. down further down here the yeah. street yeah well and I remember you and who was it Celia and yeah. Pat 
uh -huh. well, you came over to my house and I showed you how I did my pottery. Uh -huh. Yeah, right there in my kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because people come in and want to know if they can go to artist studios. Uh -huh. And, well, most Native Americans don't have studios. studios. And what <laughs> substitutes for a studio is the kitchen table. Yeah. And, you know, I often tell people that uh, potters that have kids make the kids some breakfast and, you know, chase them out the door to the, go on the school bus, yep. set up the, the canvas or the, ta the plastic tablecloth on the table, and begin their work and have to finish by 3 o'clock when the school bus brings the kids back. So, you know, the hungry mob can come through the door and get a little snack and not disturb anything that uh, is being made. Yeah. So, uh, Ruby, while you're coiling that pot, maybe you can tell me about what what you do every day at, at Hainas Pueblo? Um, mostly I concentrate on my pottery. Um, I have other hobbies that I do. I paint gourds, little gourds, like for Christmas ornaments or just decorations. Is that why you planted so many gourds this year in your yes. garden? Oh, I was wondering what you were going to do with all those gourds. No, yeah. Yeah, I paint them. In fact, this year, you know, being stuck at home, I've painted so many gourds. And then I, I do a little bit of sewing, making like um, um, pot holders, you know, for your stove and aprons and stuff like that. I don't do very much sewing anymore. I used to sew quite a bit. I used to do a lot of embroidery, but I found out that my fingers were um, getting um, where I couldn't move them. They were getting stiff from sewing. And so I gave up all the embroidery work because I rather save my um, hands for the pottery. So I've got, you know, a lot of things. I do gardening, I do, you know, I, I just have a lot of things that I do. I keep myself busy all the time, and I'm not one that sits there and watches TV. I've got to always be on the move. <laughs> wow. Now... This year, Jaimez didn't have a feast day. No. What, what sort of restrictions are going on at, at Jaimez Pueblo to keep everybody safe? Uh, well, they've got the village all closed down. Um, we've only got one entrance, one exit into the main Pueblo. There's um, security there all the time. And um, we're only allowed to go out according to our last name on Monday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. This is when we're allowed to go out to go get our um, necessary um, uh, supplies and stuff like that. Food, you know, groceries, and everything. An old pizza else. pan. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a new pizza pan. <laughs> yeah, a new pizza pan, because this one's getting holes in it. <laughs> but as you can see, I've already put three coils. Now I'm going to go ahead and um, use my thing here, and I will start smoothing it out on the inside first. And um, this, um, what you call it, um, gets the coils all together. And smooths it out up and starts shaping the pottery up. And then when I'm through doing the out inside, then I'll go to the outside, then I'll 
um, seal these coils up here on the outside. So you continually finish the inside of the pot as the pot rises. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're always working like from the inside out to get it smooth, to build it up. This first time when I'm sealing up the coils, uh, I'm just sealing up the coils, then I'll go back a second time and I'll put more pressure and build the pot up some more. Now, if you just made pots during the day, medium-sized pots, how many could you make in a day? In one day, probably maybe about seven. About seven, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, um, when I'm doing pottery, I'll um, um, take breaks. I'll get up and walk around. Because, you know, you, when you sit, you, you just get stiff in one position. So I'll get up, I'll do, do my housework, cook dinner, or just go walk around. So I, I just take my time trying to do them. So maybe when you finish smoothing those three coils, you might want to get up and walk over to some of your pieces. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about your pieces. Okay, sure. When the, when the coils are finished, though. Okay. You make it look so easy. <laughs> but then again, you probably had just a little bit of practice. <laughs> yeah, I could probably do this in my sleep right now. <laughs> now, and, the, and with, with the pots that you make, the, when you start off with one and you wind up with something that is for sale, how many pieces or what percentage of pieces do you lose along the way for various reasons? Um, well, during, if I don't have any, I mean, enough temper in there, then during the drying process, then it'll crack on me. So you could lose them all. So I could lose all of them. Ugh. And then another thing is if I make a pottery too thin, then when I'm scraping them to smooth them out, then I'll put a hole in them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and during drying process also sometimes, you know, they'll crack like right on the mouth and sometimes I'll put, I'll just so I don't have to break the whole pot down, I'll put like scallops or kiva steps or something like that just so I could save the pot. Because it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes during firing, a lot, well, a lot of times during firing, if you have some kind of foreign material, like chili seeds, for instance, or some kind of seeds that get into your clay and you miss it, then it'll cause it to pop. And, and, and so, same with air bubbles, it'll no. cause it to pop. So it sounds like that uh, both the drying and the firing are the most dangerous parts of the, the process. Yeah. Uh, which, one is, which one's the worst? Uh, I think the firing, because you've already done all your work to them, you've painted them, you know, firing's the last procedure you do, and, um, you know, and you've got all this work invested into one piece, and it pops during firing, and you say that sit there, and you feel like crying, you know, especially a large piece like this. You know, so many hours of work on it, and um, it pops on you. Okay. What, have you finished? Are you all set? Okay, well okay. then, we're gonna just hang on a few, oh, few minutes careful. until Ruby goes over to the pots. Okay.
Okay. Or just, or just leave it, unclip it, that would be fine. Well, Ruby's going to make her way over to the pieces of pottery. We uh, have them set up a little further away uh, so that we could put them all together. There are so many beautiful ones there, and all, all the pieces that you'll see here are for sale. And, you know, part of the reason that we are doing this is so that the potters will have a source of income that they are completely cut out of because of no Indian market and also no tourists here in Santa Fe. Our governor has said that anyone who comes in from out of state has to uh, quarantine for two weeks, which makes it a little hard to go on a vacation and, uh, and see the place that you want to go to if you have to stay. But um, what we'll do now is we'll have Ruby I talk to you about some of her various shapes, um, the kind of pieces that she traditionally, the shapes she traditionally makes, and some of the designs that you'll see on them. And if, um, and pretty soon we'll have some prices in front of them, so you'll be able to see what Ruby charges. And after we've heard all of these things that you have to do to make a pot, the prices will seem unbelievably reasonable. Yep, you're good. Okay. These are what we call wedding vases. Wedding vases, I have to teach myself how to do, because Zia typically doesn't do wedding vases. I'm the only one that does wedding vases. That's from Zia. I learned how, well, I watched famous people make their wedding vases, and I have I tried to form them the way I saw them. So anyway, these are my wedding vases. On this one, this is kind of a smaller one. It's got the Kiva steps going around with the clouds coming out of them. This is the tr traditional drawing of the road runner. And these are clouds here. And then on the side, I've got clouds coming in the four direction, and these are rope runner tracks. But the whole design put together, it, it turns it into a butterfly design. And on this one, I have the drumsticks up on the neck with some more clouds. And then that's one of the pieces I have here. On the bigger one down here, I have the rainbow, and then I have the thunder, I mean the clouds going around, I mean the drumsticks, and then that one is called the thunderbird, the bird that I have on there, and it's got a friendship design going around on the neck right there. And then on the side, I have my hummingbird and um, usually Zias don't have hummingbirds on their pots but I love hummingbirds so I had to make a design so I could put it on my pot and then these are kiva steps and more drum sticks and like flowers and I've got you know I've got like the um, um, rope runner on this, just colored a little bit differently, and drumsticks and clouds, and I've got the corn right here on the side, and Kiva steps, and also my hummingbird. And um, that's one of my larger pieces right there. I think I'm the only one left in Zia that doesn't really big like that. Um, I learned how to do the big pieces for my mom. Um, that, and that one has her um, parrot design on there. 
my mom would always put her, well, she would try to put parrots on her pottery, but every time, maybe two times out of three, her parrot design would, um, um, it would crack, but she never stopped trying putting parrots. So when I started doing pottery, I said, well, I'll just use my mom's parrot design. So I've always, but I have better luck with the parrot design. And this one's got a double rainbow and the corn, but instead of the regular corn leaves, I put drumsticks on them. And these are all stone polished. And I will demonstrate how I stone polish them. The background, I stone polish the red, the rainbows, and the birds. Anywhere I use red or yellow, I will stone polish. The only thing I don't stone polish is my black paint. Okay? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Uh-huh. And, of course, I have to do my own different shapes and stuff. I, these ones I have like the scalloped mouth and everything on them and I polished the mouth and everything and it's got my mom's parrot on there. So these are kind of my like my my signature pieces. Okay. Well, that's nice, Ruby. You want to keep going back to coiling? Okay, sure. All right. Give me one second. I'll get you moved over. Go okay. ahead and head over. Okay. So, Ruby, I noticed that you had a piece of fabric over your pot, even though you were only going to be gone a few minutes. Why, why did you I, do that? I always do that so the clay doesn't dry out. The clay dries out pretty, pretty fast, especially the small loose ends. It will dry out, so I always cover it with the fabric if I have to get up and go do something. If I'm going to be gone for a little while, I'll use a plastic to keep the clay from getting hard so I can come back to work on it again. Do you have to continually cover your pieces so they dry slowly? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, especially, um, well, the regular pottery, I let them, you know, dry at room temperature and um, but the uh, stew bowls and stuff like that those ones I have to keep them covered with uh, like a sheet or a towel or something so they can dry really really slow because if they dry too fast then then um, they, they tend to crack and even pottery, if they dry too fast, you know, when it's too hot, they, they tend to crack also. So I, you know, don't, don't let them dry too fast. I know one year I uh, was getting ready for market and um, it was so hot that year, everything was cracking. And I was to the point of um, tears, you know, because I had to keep breaking them down, re-soaking my clay. And um, anyway, um, so I had to um, go ahead um, and invest in a air conditioner. Um, 
a regular air conditioner. I had to go buy one in order to control the temperature in the room that I was working in. Because it was, even when I was making it, it was drying out and it was cracking on me. And I had to um, control the temperature, keep it the right temperature, because it was too hot. Yeah. If, for example, you had a piece of pottery that you made, like you're doing right now, and when you finished it today, it was 10 inches tall. After you painted it and then fired it, well, first it dried and then you painted it and you fired it, how big would that 10 inch pot be? It probably shrink down to maybe seven inches. Woo! Eight, seven, eight to seven inches high. Wow. So that pot that's over your uh, right shoulder that is so big that's sitting on the, the bench there, that yes. started out considerably bigger. Oh, yes. When you made it. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a lot bigger. In fact, I had to in order to finish the top part, I had to stand and put the coils on and um, smooth the inside. I had to stand and lean over it so I could get get it all, all made. Seems like if you make them big enough, you'd have to climb inside to smooth it up. I know. <laughs> <laughs> really. I tell people, you can take a bath in it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I know I made one pot. The biggest pot I ever made was, it was 28 inches high, and it was huge. And in order for me to fire it, my husband and I had to both put it on the fire because I couldn't handle it by myself. It was just, it wasn't heavy. It was just awkward to be able to put it on the fire. And we do, um, traditionally, the way we fire our pottery is um, we use slabs of sheep manure or cow manure. And um, that's how we traditionally fire it. But now, we're kind of, um, with all the air pollution and everything, then um, we kind of gotten modern. So we use uh, like an electric kiln. Um, so, but a lot of times when I'm getting ready for like Indian market or something like that, I will, still fire the old traditional way. And um, so, and it's a lot of hard work when you're doing it by yourself, all the firing and everything like that, even collecting the cow pies. Is our cow pies the only fuel that you use? Do you use wood as well? Um, I use a little bit of wood just to get the fire started underneath. And then the, after that, when my fire gets going, then I use just the manure. Well, I should just tell everyone that's tuning in that first of all, uh, if you wanna go to Zoom, Zoom is live. Also, if you are interested in seeing Ruby's pieces up close, you can now go to our website and all of her pieces are there with their uh, descriptions, with their sizes, and with their prices. And a way to purchase them if you would choose to do so. But uh, just to announce that Zoom is going, the pots are online. It took us a little longer than we thought it would, but this is the first time out for us. And Ruby is the first person to be brave enough to suffer all of the consequences of our lack of technology. And uh, 
She is uh, just doing a great job, and we are having lots and lots of fun here watching this pot just rise from the table. Anyway, how, and so you make them like cylinders first? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll make them like cylinders straight, and then when I get to the point where I want to start shaping the mouth, then I'll start coiling a different way. I'll put the coils kind of like on the inside instead of straight up. So this is where pretty much I'm up to the size that I want to be in. And um, after I smooth these coils, then I'll start um, forming the neck part. And then after I finish shaping the pot, I mean making the pot, then I'll let it sit for a little while, let it kind of stiffen up. Then I'll go back in with my uh, smoother here and I'll, I'll start stretching it and shaping it out. Well, for all of you who are just tuning in, I'm Andrea Fisher, the owner of Andrea Fisher Fine Pottery. We've been here in Santa Fe for 27 years. Oh, seems like forever some days. Uh, and other days, it's like we just started. It's really quite amazing. And um, what we're doing here, this Indian market time, is that we are in the process of having demonstrations five days a week, starting today, Tuesday through Saturday, for the entire month of August. 26 other of our favorite potters, including Ruby. Uh, 26 others will be joining us over that time period at specific times that are printed on our website, more or less. Uh, the, the, today we had a little bit of technical difficulty getting started because the computer, I guess, I don't know if the computer decided or something else decided, that uh, some human decided that they were going to update everything during the night. And as a result, we had to sort of begin the process of loading and uploading and all that other stuff uh, when we had not planned to do that today. So our apologies, and please bear with us, because those kinds of things may happen um, a little further down the line. But in case you missed what, we, what, would, what happened earlier, Rupi brought some of her clay from, um, Zia Pue from Zia Pueblo. Even though she lives at Jemez Pueblo, she's married to a guy from Jemez, and that's why, why she lives there. Uh, she brought clay. Uh, she started off by making a nice big fat bowl, ball of clay and then smoothing it into a, a small bowl called a, a puki that... Uh, establishes the bottom of the pot. And right now what she's doing that is she's rolling out these logs, worms, spaghetti, whatever you want to call them, of clay and stacking them on top of each other. And that's how all of her pots are formed. In fact, that's how all the pots in this gallery are, are formed. And then Right now, when a coil goes on, she begins, she smooths it, pushing the coils together so there are no air pockets or no splits and the two, the coils bind to each other. The reason that it's done this way is because when um, the, the Native American cultures didn't have a wheel and they only knew about the wheel when the Spaniards arrived in the late 1500s. And because pottery making is so tied to their religion that those traditional ways of making pots will never die. And it is, you know, our um, sort of purpose of, of the gallery is to make sure that those traditional techniques carry on forever, if possible, and that uh, we are able to promote these non-technical forms of uh, making pottery. Ruby talked about some of her tools earlier. A broken cup, 
an old kitchen knife, a pizza pan, and so far that's what she has used, and oh, and a bowl. That's what she has used so far to, to make her pieces of pottery. And what I find really, truly remarkable and astounding is that those primitive tools can, with a lot of talent, a lot of expertise, a lot of practice, <laughs> that all of these um, primitive techniques can produce such an incredible product. And so where are you now in your pottery making, Ruby? Huh? Where, what, what are you up to now? Now I'm going to start forming it where oh, it's going to that's, uh, that's start wonderful. taking like a pottery shape now. And do, I, you, do you use any tools to, to shape it? Or do you, or, I, or do, you have, do you have 10 tools at the end of your hands <laughs> that you yeah. use to, to form it? No, I use my tools here. I start putting the way I put my coils in, they'll start going in. And then um, I'll, um, it'll start forming the like a pottery shape. And then I'll go back in when I'm smoothing, then I'll, you know, it'll form like a pottery shape. And my assumption is, is that after your finish making this pot a little later on in the day, you will um, show us all of your paint and um, how you make your paint and you will actually paint one of your pieces. Yes, I will stone polish one. I've got a piece that's all ready to be stone polished. And, um, and then I can show you all my paints, how I get all my paints and um, how I paint my pottery. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see the firing process because I think the neighbors upstairs might get a little <laughs> upset if we start lighting some wood and some cow pies yeah. in the middle <laughs> of the gallery here. Yeah, we've got uh, the whole fire department here. Yeah, the whole <laughs> fire department. But you know, most of those guys are so cute, that might be okay. Uh, but I'm sure as Ruby uh, goes along, she'll tell you more about uh, the firing process and the traditional firing process. It was really fun earlier to see uh, the temper, the um, ground up basalt rocks that make uh, the clay sturdier uh, and hold together. It's sort of like a binder that holds it together. Uh, and how important each one of these steps are and how refined the technique is and how, because it's been experimented for, on for the last thousand years, maybe more, that, uh, that, that the whole technique is you know, sort of down pat. And uh, while variation sometimes can occur, it's uh, not often successful because these proven ways over the last thousand years or so uh, have really uh, made it possible for Native Americans to make all these beautiful pieces. Now, Ruby, do you use any of these pieces at home? Uh, yes, we still do. We still use all our, uh, a lot of our pieces. Um, this one, we would, um, what they used to use this size right here was their water jars to carry water um, from the river because we didn't used to have water in the village, you know, piped in water. So this was what they used to carry their water on top of their head. You know, they'd walk up back up the hill with the pot, no hands. What, what was the source of water? Just the river. The river. Yeah, the river was our source of water. And uh, even when I was growing up, we didn't have um, piped in water. We had one water well, and that was down by the day school. And every, every morning when we were going to um, school, 
um, we would take our buckets with us. And on the way home, well, we'd leave them, leave them at the well. And uh, on the way home, we would carry our, fill up our buckets and walk back up the hills from school to with a couple of buckets of water. <laughs> And we used to do, even do our laundry at the river. We used to have these rocks that we'd wash our clothes on in the river. How long ago was that? That was when I was probably, oh gosh, maybe seven, eight years old. I'm 66 now, so it's been a while. You know, we've gotten a little modernized. We've got running water. We've got bathrooms. We've got washers and dryers now. <laughs> you know, so we don't have to. That's why I tell my daughter she's so spoiled. You know, she didn't have to go through what I did when I was growing up. Uh-uh. You know, I we used to, uh, my grandfather used to have um, 500 heads of sheep. And... Before before we went to school in the morning, he'd get us up real early, and we'd take help him take the sheep to the pasture where he was going to grace the sheep for the day, and we'd leave him there with the sheep and come home, and um, uh, what to call it, um, go to school, and then. And then after school, after we took our buckets of water home, we'd run back to where we left him and help him bring the sheep back home again to the corral, to the pen. I think your assistant I know. is there helping you. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you who have never been to the gallery, that's Stout. <laughs> he's one of our gallery dogs. He's going to help uh, me make the and, pot. And he's going to help Ruby make pots. She's very, very good at that. Uh, and surprisingly, even with two dogs in here uh, and two tails in here, they've never broken a piece, which is great. But uh, it's fun to have um, the dogs in here, and especially if Ruby needs an assistant. Yeah, to pick up my clay. <laughs> Well, I'm sure he was just looking for a handout. Yeah. yeah. I, I think he's looking for crumbs that I dropped. <laughs> so how long have you lived in Jemez Pueblo? I've been in Jemez 41 years now. Wow. Longer than what I lived in Zia. <laughs> yeah. But you still work in the Zia style. Yeah. Is that because you learned that tradition? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, well, like I said, I, my mom taught me how. And um, since I was Zia, I figured, well, I'll do Zia pottery instead of doing Hamas pottery. I could have done Hamas pottery. I mean, I had access to all their materials, all their clays, because their clay is different. And I, in fact, I did try Hamas clay. I could not work with it. It was, it wasn't um, like clay enough. It was too sandy, and I couldn't shape my pots the way I wanted to. And, you know, they, you said you had access to the materials. Is that common for someone to marry into the Pueblo and then have access to the, the traditions of that Pueblo? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. In fact, um, I think um, Elizabeth Medina and I traded places. <laughs> but... Um, oh, so was, Elizabeth Medina was from Hamas. Elizabeth's actually from Hamas. And, um, but instead of staying with the Hamas pottery, she decided that she wanted to do, do Zia pottery and she, she learned how from her mother-in-law. Sophia. Sophia. Uh-huh, so she married in yeah. Zia. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, so 
But me, I decided, you know, I knew how to do Zia pottery and I was going to stay with it. I was going to stay traditional and everything. And so you get your clay from Zia because the clay from Jemez is different. Yeah, it, their clay isn't, um, it's more sandy. It's not like, um, you can't really go like this. You it's know? not elastic. It's not elastic. And I couldn't work with it. I just, you know, I gave it a try and I just couldn't work with it. So if the clay is elastic, are you going to make face masks? <laughs> I <don't laughs> really, I clay. should have. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have to worry about breathing in and out after yeah. all, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm at the point where I'm going to start shaping it, giving it the shape of a pot. And as usual, I go in the inside first. You ready? You going to give me a hand now? Huh? <laughs> Smells good, huh? I think the dog wants to eat my clay too. <laughs> That's coming out really beautifully, Ruby. Thank you. Yeah, you, as you can see, it's getting a little bit bigger. Um, I guess just forming them, you know, play, being able to play with clay, you know, I'm the only, well, a lot of us potters get to play with mud all the time, you know, you don't have to be a kid to play with mud. <laughs> so you could be a kid forever. Yep, you can. And it's really great because, you know, it gets you in the outdoors and yeah. um, getting all of your materials and preparing all of it. And, I mean, you can enjoy the beautiful New Mexico sunshine. It, uh, it's very satisfying to have beautiful finished products. And you can make a living now. Yeah. Yeah, and it keeps you in shape, too, with keeps all the shape. digging clay and hauling it and everything. It keeps you in shape. Got a lot of exercise. Now, what about the kids at Zia? Are there kids still, you know, are they making pots? There's a few. They've got some... Um, um, some that are doing, you know, a little bit. Um, my sister Eleanor is, um, well, last couple of years, she's been teaching, having classes there in Zia for the younger kids to learn how to make pottery. And a lot of them do learn how, but I think they feel that this is such a hard living that they don't stick to it. I think there's maybe seven of us most active that are in, still in doing in Zia pottery. You said seven? Yeah, that's that's, that's all. It. How many how many people are there at Zia, roughly? Roughly, it's probably over a thousand people now. A thousand eight, people? Eight to, to a thousand, eight hundred to a thousand people. And only seven potters? Uh-huh. Oh. It's slowly dying out and we're trying to keep it alive, you well, know. Well, is pottery making taught in the, in the schools? Huh? Is pottery making taught in school? That's where my sister Eleanor's teaching. Oh. Um, she's te teaching pottery making, 
uh, language classes because a lot of the younger kids don't know how to speak in Zia. They, they're raised to speaking English. They don't know their our language anymore. So we're slowly losing our language. And you are Tiwa spe speaking? No, Carries. Carries. Uh -huh. Yeah. And how do the languages differ? Um, our dialects, well, like, um, I know Tiwa, Towa, they're kind of similar in the way they pronounce their words and stuff like that, but, um, um, Carries, um, there's San Domingo, um, San Felipe, Santa Ana, and Laguna, and we all speak um, Carries, but it's like different dialects of it. Are they related like, like Italian and, uh, and French and English are related, or are they completely, is Carries completely separate? No, I think they are related. They are related. Yeah. Can you understand someone uh, from yeah. from, uh, from Acoma, for example? Uh huh. You can. Yeah. Yeah, oh, I can okay. understand certain parts of like what Spanish and Italian. Yeah. Can uh, recognize each other. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I was doing a show and I was surprised. Um, when I was doing a show up in Taos Pueblo um, during the Taos Fiestas, um, the um, clowns, they were out, and I could actually understand some of the words they were saying. And even, thought, even the bad words? <laughs> <laughs> because you know those clowns. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, I could understand some of the words, and I think they speak uh, Toa or Tiwa or something like that up there, but I could still understand some of the words they were saying. You know, Hamas didn't have their feast day this year. Um, what, maybe you can tell the people that are listening in, uh, what feast day is and, and what what happens on feast day? Um, feast day is a celebration of um, the different saints that we have there that were brought by the Spanish. And um, uh, on August 2nd, it's actually the Pecos feast. Because um, Pecos and Jemez, during the um, revolt, I guess Pecos, um, they were almost wiped out. And um, anyway, so they joined up with the Jemez, so they became one Pueblo. But we have two feasts. We have the Pecos feast, which is August 2nd. And then we have the traditional Hamas feast, which is on November 12th. And um, we usually have like um, the traditional corn dance during the day. And, um, and then we have open house where anybody, whoever wants to can come to your door, walk into your house and we'll feed them. You know, I mean, I cook like for days trying to get ready for feast. So anyway, we feed anybody that comes into the house. I was raised, I know a lot of people, they like to lock their doors and go watch the dances. But me, I was raised with my grandpa and he told me, told us when we were growing up, never to lock our doors and we're to stay there and whoever walks in we're to feed them because you don't know if it's going to be the saint or somebody walking in checking testing you if you're really you know um being hospitable or something like that 
And I guess we get blessed when, you know, with feeding everybody because it's just open house. I've had busloads of kids show up at my house and I, you know, I fed them. You know, people just walk in and say, we're hungry, can we eat here? I say, sure, come on in, sit down. And a lot of them have become friends, mm -hmm. you know. So, and then we're not allowed to sell pottery during feast day, not, you know, not for Hamas feast, even though if I'm, I do Zia pottery, I live there in Hamas, I'm not allowed to sell any pottery that day. So it's a day of celebration. It's not, a day, not, day of not celebration. Not a day of uh, work and income. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, you know, for the, for people who are listening who might not know, the the word pueblo is merely a Spanish word that means village, and Pecos that Ruby was talking about, um, the town of Pecos, uh, which used to be the the pueblo of Pecos is south and east of Santa Fe, uh, up in the mountains, uh, part of the old Santa Fe Trail. And feast days are really fun. Uh, uh, I don't, I'm not so sure, Derek, what are you, what are you telling me? Why don't you so just... we just got a text, thank you everybody for letting us know that a portion of our website is not working. You can email us if you'd like to be part of the Zoom conversation at zoom at andreafisherpottery.com. We are working to resolve it right now. Thank you everybody. Why don't you say it again? So if you would just email zoom, Z-O-O-M, at andreafisherpottery.com, and you'll get the link to the Zoom invite. Thanks so much. Well, you know, here we go. Uh, <laughs> pra we're not. practicing on Ruby. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, she is um, really um, flexible enough to... Uh, take care of our, to, to, to celebrate our technical prowess or our technical uh, mishaps. But um, hopefully you will be able to uh, zoom on here and ask Ruby a, a few questions. But a few more things about Feast Day. Um, feast, I'm sure there were some sort of feasts and celebrations that were traditionally part of Pueblo life before the Spaniards showed up. And my guess is that it was probably a way of sharing the wealth where you would feed people because you had bounty and maybe they, they didn't have, they weren't as quite as fortunate as you are. I know in some of the Pueblos they have something called giveaways and giveaways are usually uh, done by the, the people that are elected to offices. And the people that are elected to offices are usually people that are um, on the rich side. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? And um, what they would do then is during these feasts is they would share their, their crops, they would share their... Um, their animals, their kills, their, they would share their firewood with other members that, of the tribe that weren't quite as fortunate as they were. And then those feast days morphed into a celebration of saints because when the Spaniards came here, oh, they came well armed, so to speak, to make everyone become Catholics. And it was the Catholic Church um, and their saints that are celebrated in the Pueblos. The Pueblos aren't quite as strictly Catholic as they used to be. I know that other religious groups have made inroads, and some of the, uh, some of the religious groups um, have, have you know, established um, 
and, and the traditional uh, religion is still very much a part of what happens at the Pueblos. But feast day is really cool because what happens is you know that whoever's house you're going to to eat, they have spent hours and hours and hours and tons and tons of money uh, buying groceries or raising, raising the food that they are going to be uh, serving. And it is an, an enormous smorgasbord of all kinds of traditional things. When you go in, you wait, you sit down and, you know, in the back somewhere or along the side of the wall and you're called in to eat when there's a space for you at the table. So everything is family style. And you're given a bowl, not a plate, but a bowl because a lot of the food that's served is liquidy. And many of the pieces of pottery that they used in the old times were uh, cooking pots, and so you cooked in you cooked your meats and vegetables in li in water, in liquid, um, on the fire, and would ladle that out into a bowl, bowls that, you know, the traditional a traditional shape that is done in the pueblos, and that is you know really still done today, even though they're not handmade bowls. Um, more than likely, um, they are something that can be easily stuck in the dishwasher. Uh, the, the food consists of all kinds of, of chilies and stews and dried corn, chicos, pasole, um, that are cooked with pieces of meat. Um, sometimes people will have salads and vegetables and more desserts than anyone can imagine. And uh, food is just continually brought out from the, the kitchen by the lady of the house, and usually her sisters or her kids are there helping her out. And so larger bowls of food are brought out to the table, and they're passed around, and you just help yourself, and everyone chats and has a really good time and gets to know each other, and when you're done eating, you get up and uh, you uh, leave so that someone else can come in, can be called to come in and, and take your place. This happens from morning till night. Uh, and the pots on the stove are usually, you know, like five gallon size or bigger, where all of these little tasty treats have been cooking sometimes for days. And they bake bread out in the oh. hornos and the ovens. And uh, it, I mean, it, it's really a wonderful, wonderful treat. And if you're an outsider like me or my family, probably the most insulting thing you could ever do in, in the whole wide world is try to pay someone for, for your, your <laughs> meal. Because this is their gift to others, um, a way of sharing what they have. And it's a lovely, lovely, touching way to celebrate uh, with our Native people. So if you're ever at the Pueblos and you're watching the dances on feast day and someone says, oh, my auntie wants you to come and eat at her house, by all means, jump at the chance because it's a wonderful, wonderful, giving, generous uh, experience and one uh, an experience that doesn't happen as uh, much in this country as it used to. But anyway, how you doing, Ruby? Tell us what I'm, you're up to. I'm finished. I finished making my pot. As you can see, I've got it shaped like a pot, and I'll let this one sit for a little while. Let the clay get stiffened, and I'll go back in, stretch it out, make it more shape of a pottery, and um, that's it for... And will you let that happen today, or will that yeah. be done at a later time? No, I'll do it here in a little while. Um, I usually check my clay by squeezing it together, see if it's a little bit stiffer, 
so that way when I stretch it out, it doesn't collapse. And when you let it dry a little bit like that, do you cover it with anything, or will you no, just let I it just sit let in it the sit air? Like that. Uh huh. And um, but as I was saying, we used to use these for carrying water, and we still do use them for water, you know, during ceremonies. And the uh, big pots like this one behind me, these were actually, um, <laughs> I think I honey, 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 honey likes the pot too. Uh, actually, what they were used for was to store food, store corn, wheat, and stuff like that. They just... Uh, cover the top. In fact, we've got some real old ones that my um, grandmother and my great grandmother had done. They're still there in Zia. A few of them have gotten stolen, but there's still a couple of pieces there because my grandpa was the cacique of the Pueblo, of Zia Pueblo. And what is that? The cacique is the head of everybody there in the Pueblo. He's the it's one like that... like the chief or the president kind of or like the prime like minister. Like chief, yeah. you know. And um, so he was the cacique there. And my grandmother used to make all the pots for to store their corn, you know, because we had a um, field for the Pueblo, you know, like... Um, Everybody would um, help in growing the corn for further use in the year for ceremonies and stuff like that. So they used to use the storage jars, the ollas, for that. And they, they used to have a lot of them. And then we used to grow our own wheat and um, to make our wheat flour and different things from it. So that's what the storage jars are used for, were used for. Now they're used for pretty, pretty much for decorations. Um, but the ones that the Pueblo still has, they're still used for storing stuff. You know, like the seed corn that they're going to use for the community um, field and stuff like that. And then we make um, bowls, chili bowls that we serve, like chili stew or any kind of stew, we still use those. And um, the dough bowls, the big dough bowls that we make our um, tortilla dough in and everything like that. So all our pottery are still, we're still able to use them. Now before the Spanish came, um, Corn and beans and chili. Where the, that was the, the basic diet, plus, uh -huh. plus whatever you could chase down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, what, what, there wasn't any wheat then, was there? Any what? Wheat. I'm not sure when wheat came. I know we had corn. It wasn't the, like the sweet corn or nothing like that. It's... Um, you know, we have the blue corn and the white corn, and our corn didn't grow in long, what you call it, like corn cobs. They were kind of small. So anyway, but um, that was the native corn that we have, and we still grow them. We still grow them too. And, uh, but I don't know exactly when the wheat came in or whatever, but we still have, you know, traditional, and our chili isn't the big hatch chili. Our chili only grows like small, you know, and they are super hot. My husband brought some home from the field the other day. I couldn't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ever need to take the paint off your refrigerator, oh, yeah. you can just smear some chili on it, and that paint will yeah. bubble right up. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I took one bite of it. I said, oh, my God, I had tears in my eyes. My ears were burning. I'm like, give me some milk, please. <laughs> well, you know, chili is really weird stuff because you can plant... 
um, the same seeds in different places and get something different. And it depends on uh, the, the soil, it depends on the amount of rain, and it depends on what stage in its formation that the chili is in because the one in one place might be very mild because their conditions were completely different than the other place where the chili is flaming hot. And, yeah. it's, the, and it's the same seeds from the same pepper. It's, it's really quite amazing. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, this is going to sit here for a while. Yeah. Okay, well good. Would you like us to put it somewhere? Would you like us to put it over with the pots that you have? In fact, maybe you can come over and talk a little bit about your pots. That'll sure. give you a chance to stretch your legs and yeah. Oh yeah. Gotta get you all unhooked. Well, you saw that beautiful, symmetrical, even walled pot just rise from a bunch of rolled out clay. It's really, really, truly amazing. The high shoulder, it's such a beautiful shape. And Ruby's going to talk a little bit about the pieces that she brought with her today to sell. And uh, the pieces are all on our uh, website. Uh, they start in the descending order of price with the most expensive ones first, going down to the least expensive ones at the bottom. Um, and, and we uh, have... A, quite a variety of, of Ruby's pieces uh, for sale. And you know, the reason that we're doing that is because Indian Market isn't available to, to people. And you know, what most of the people at Indian Market really rely on um, the market for a great portion of their annual income. And for some of them, it is their only income for the year. So you can imagine how devastating it must be to um, have, um, or have, you know, organizations have to close because of oh, this pandemic. But Ruby, one of the reasons that we chose Ruby is, well, first of all, well, like she said, there are only seven, eight, nine Zia Potters left at Zia Pueblo out of a thousand people. And Ruby makes wonderful, wonderful pieces. Her pieces are um, really um, very nicely priced, considering all the work that goes into them, that's for sure. And that uh, we want that to the tradition to be able to carry on. And we also want Ruby to make sure that she can still make a living selling pots so that she doesn't go out and be a greeter at Walmart or some other thing that's not as creative and is not as traditional as her work as both a potter and an artist. Now, for the next four weeks, we're going to be having demonstrations every single day. There will be a grand total of 26 of our favorite artists that are uh, going to be here. Tomorrow, I mean, we're not done with Ruby today, not by a long shot, because she's going to show us how to stone polish, and she's going to show us how to make paint, and 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 because all the paints are all natural minerals and plant materials, she's going to show us how she does paint. But tomorrow we will have Thomas Tenorio. Thomas Tenorio, bless his heart, he's 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 a great guy from um, 
Santa Domingo Pueblo. And while he does make a few smaller pieces, he's really known for making ones that you can take a bath in. Giant pieces, which he uh, paints. And his pieces look very, very different than uh, Ruby's pieces because the clay that he uses is from a different area. You know, like I tell people in here that if the dirt in your front yard looks can be look completely different than the dirt in your backyard, and if you are, um, you know, 30 miles away, you can imagine what the variety must be. And so instead of this nice caramel colored with the, the red and, and black painting on it, Thomas does rather buff colored um, pots with black uh, designs painted on them and only a small amount of red. Um, but he will be with us here on Wednesday. On Thursday is Hubert Candelario and there's really no one quite like Hubert. Um, he makes micaceous pots. He uses a micaceous slip and he, uh, he, he makes wonderful, wonderful swirl pots and cutout pots. Uh, I always tease him all the time when we see those swirl melon pots that the flavor of the day a Dairy Queen is orange. They're so perfectly done that they almost look like they were extruded from a pasta machine. Um, and then, you know, we have a variety of people coming um, the rest of the week, Paula and um, Paula Estevan and Robert Cassero. Paula is from Acoma. Uh, Robert's from right next door in, in Laguna, and they are partners. And then on Saturday, Marvin and Francis Martinez. Um, they each do part of the, the work. Mar uh, as opposed, Paula makes her own pots, paints her own pots. Robert makes his own pots, paints his own pots. But in Marvin and um, Francis's case, Francis makes the pot, and Marvin does all the design work, all the painting on the black on black pieces. Now, um, Marvin is Maria's great grandson, uh, Maria Martinez, the famous Maria Martinez from San Ildefonso Pueblo. And uh, when Marvin and Francis are here demonstrating, I'm sure that I will say a few things about Maria Martinez, maybe a whole lot of things about Maria Martinez, but. Um, Marvin, I'm sure, is going to have all kinds of wonderful stories about growing up at San Ildefonso and having such a famous great-grandma and uh, what he learned from her. Because Marvin was very much alive when Maria passed in 1980. He was a kid, but still I'm sure he um, remembers all of those things and may have even had some uh, lessons from Maria along the way. So that sort of takes care of this coming week. The following week, um, we will have uh, five separate days of potters. But, you know, next, that following week, we're going to have a couple family groups. For example, um, uh, Wilma Bakatosa and her husband will be here making pots. The following day, Sandra Victorino and her son, Cletus, they, from Acoma Pueblo, will be here. And then the following day, um, there'll be uh, Kevin Naranjo. And, you know, I don't know how um, Joe and Eunice Naranjo are related to Kevin Naranjo, but... Naranjo at Santa Clara Pueblo is like Smith or Jones or Johnson in this country. I would say that a third of the people in um, Santa Clara are named Naranjo. The other third are named Tafoya, and the last third are named all the other names at Santa Clara Pueblo. But uh, um, Eunice and Joseph do extremely beautiful black pieces, some with a little scraffito. 
Kevin, on the other hand, does a tremendous amount of scraffito, and the scraffito of his animals are just absolutely breathtaking. They look so real, it looks like they're going to jump right off the pot. Then we'll have Sherry Tafoya on Wednesday from Santa Clara also, Jackie Shativa on Thursday, and Carol and Concho on Friday, and on Saturday, got to turn the page, will be Sammy Naranjo and his um, partner Melanie. Sammy does black and tan scraffito pieces, and Melanie basically makes turtles. And turtles, you know, are really very interesting in, in Native American culture because um, they are sort of to, they're, they're very much like Noah. Um, when, human, when the Great Flood came, humanity had to have a place to go, and Noah uh, took them all into his ark. Well, the turtle let all of humanity climb onto his back because he could live both on the land and in the water. And so when the waters receded, uh, the turtle went for the dry land, he, and the turtle dumped us off, and, and here we are today. So that is what is happening on our uh, agenda next week. Now, Ruby is going to come and talk about some of her pieces, I'm sort of looking around for her because I know she's hiding in here someplace, but she had to get up and stretch her legs a little bit after making that really gorgeous, gorgeous pot. So what we'll do is we'll go to Ruby, and she will have a little bit of fun telling you about all the pieces that she made. Thank you, and thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead, try keep talking. Okay, this piece is one of my kind of special pots. It's got the scalp mouth, uh, mouth. it's got the thunderbird, and uh, I've got Kiva steps, and I've got different colors. This is my traditional red, but in mixing my um, paints, I can get different colors. This one is actually the red paint that I have here mixed with my black paint. So I kind of experiment with my paint, different paints and stuff. The yellow that's on the mouth on this one is um, a mixture of my gray clay, mm -hmm. my gray paint, which is this color right here the background slip mixed with my red. So, you know, I'm always experimenting with all my paints just to get different colors and stuff like that. And um, so this is kind of like, um, kind of like a decorative piece. You won't really use this for, you know, um, utilitarian piece. So Ruby, I just got a question emailed to us by uh -huh. Daniel from Los Angeles, uh -huh. and he says, we purchased our first ruby pot in 1992, uh -huh. uh, a 10-inch water jar. How has ruby changed her methods or designs over the past 28 years? I really haven't changed my methods. I've just added different colors, you know, by mixing different paints, and... Um, my designs are more bolder. I mean, my like my lines, they're more bolder. And because um, I, when I first started, I used to use like real fine lines. And um, so they've got. You can see my designs a lot better. Okay. Do you want to tell me about some of the other pots that you have? Okay. Um, well, you see my wedding vase. Uh, this is the size that I made right now. It's kind of this one right here that I just made will be this size right here by the time it dries and shape, um, um, shrinks down and everything. And this one has my thunder, I mean, my hummingbird and then the corn, 
and it's got the drum, I mean drumsticks going around in the circles, and then I've got drumsticks, and um, with my designs, I, you know, because we have to be traditional in all our designs. There are certain designs that we cannot use on our pottery because um, a lot of it is for ceremonial use only. So I like make my own designs, you know, by putting them differently. And this is my um, quail. My, it's not a roadrunner. That's not a roadrunner. That's my depiction of the quail. Okay. <laughs> and um, so, and then this one right here is kind of like a long neck vase. And it's got my traditional drawing of the roadrunner, Kiva steps again. And then, of course, the corn design, but with the drumsticks on it. And then these are all stone polished, the neck, everything stone polished. So those are my, my designs. Did you learn many of these designs from your grandma? Yeah, these are all um, traditional, that, um, you know, that my mom, my grandma, they used to use. So it's been all passed down. Do you have a favorite design that you like to use? Uh, I like to use um, like the road runner and the rainbows. Sometimes I'll put double rainbows and then the Kiva steps. But my favorite is always the hummingbird because I love hummingbirds. Do you have a lot of hummingbirds out at Hayman's? Yeah, I've got like four hummingbird feeders around my house. Oh, good. So I've got tons of hummingbirds. Yeah, I had to rescue one from inside my house yesterday. <laughs> I leave my doors open and one decided that he was coming in and so I have to catch them with a cloth while they're very scared and yeah. bring them outside. Uh, but then they play dead for a little while and then they fly away. Yeah. I've had to do that too. Mm -hmm. In fact, they come by my kitchen window, and if their feel, uh, feeder is empty, they'll start pecking on my kitchen window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, feed me, you know? <laughs> yep, that's quite fun. Yeah. So, uh, tell me about these fluted rim pieces. Uh huh. So, why the fluting on the rim? Uh, it's just something different, you know, just to, instead of just sticking to the traditional pottery, I just decided, well, I'll try something different. You know, I've always, like I say, I've always got to um, experiment, see how far my clay is going to stretch and, you know, what I can do with my clay. Yeah, and you even make small pieces. Yeah, I do small, small size, and you know, just it's when I'm doing shows, I do like different sizes. Everybody, you know, doesn't want to or doesn't have the space for a big pot or anything like that. So I do the smaller pieces. And in fact, when I first started doing pottery, that's all I used to do was just real tiny pieces, you know. And I used to do like turtles and stuff like that. And um, then I started getting where I was more comfortable with doing the bigger pieces till I got to the big pots. Uh, how many years did it take you to get to the big pots? It took me probably about four years before I started doing the real big storage jars, the Oyas. And uh, how, uh, how many times did you ha have them break before you were able to get them <laughs> to actually come out of the fire? Oh gosh. It it's, it's, um, 
I don't know. Usually I'll make maybe three big pots, half two of them come out okay. During the drying process, the firing process, only two will come out. Well, yeah, it, it's a lot of work making all these pots and we can see that you're doing a good job at it and it's quite wonderful that you're keeping the tradition alive and well and we really appreciate you being here and showing us how uh, that we can make this all continue for the people of Zia Pueblo and all the different Pueblos. So we're really happy that you're here and uh, really glad that it's all seeming to work out well. So, um, is there, uh, so you make wedding vases, correct? Yes, I do. Yep, and so what does a wedding vase represent? The wedding vase, actually, they used to use it in the wedding ceremony, where the couple would share their first drink out of the wedding vase. And, um, anyway, that, the, you know, they would share, like, their wine. They had out of that after they were, you know, pronounced husband and wife. That was their instead of a wedding cake. That was their what to call it. I I, I don't like cake because it just goes here. Oh, so yeah. uh, <laughs> so I think this would be a much nicer gift for a wedding than uh, than a cake. Yeah, definitely. And lasts a little longer. Yeah. Yep. Well, Ruby, are you ready to do some more demo for us? Oh, or, yeah. uh, all right. Yes. Well, uh, I'm gonna like I'm gonna leave this on the pieces, and then you can head over here, okay. and we'll get you all squared away. Okay. Okay, this is a piece that I'm gonna stone polish. I'm gonna put the background slip on, the gray slip. I'm gonna... Is that the piece you just made, Ruby? Just no, this it? one, I had it all prepared. Oh, you <laughs> yeah, this is a raw piece of pottery that I had. Well, yeah. I, know, I know it's dry in New Mexico, but it's not quite that dry. Yeah. Uh-huh. So what are you gonna? That that's the pot that you coiled earlier. That is going to look like this pot in yes. terms of its coloration uh -huh. and its dryness and yeah. and the fact that it doesn't bend or or do anything else anymore. And uh, and how long did that particular piece take to dry? Uh, it took about a week to dry. Because um, you saw where I made the pot, I go in and shape it to where it's this shape, and then I let it sit and start drying. And when it's dry, like about half ways down, then I take it out of the pookie, the bowl, and shape the bottom better. And, um, and then after that, then I let it face it down where it won't, you know, the air doesn't get into the pot too much, so it'll dry slowly. So anyway, so they're all face down when they're drying. And then after that, then I'll, after it's completely dry, 
then I'll take some sanding paper and start sanding it off, smoothing it out. And I use a, like a rough sanding paper to get the real rough spots out first. And then I'll take a real fine sanding paper and I'll start sanding it to get all the lines and stuff out. So this one, this piece is ready for my background slip. Now, did, how much did that piece shrink in the drawing process? Um, a little bit? Yeah, it shrank. You can see the piece that I made. It's going to come out this size. So it shrank down probably maybe three, four inches. Really? Yeah. Wow. So. So what are you doing there? This one I'm going to apply the background slip and no, I slip, slip slip it's the paint that I use and it's actually a gray clay mm -hmm. um, that I use which comes out this um, beige color mm -hmm. and this one when it comes out of the ground this is actually the way it looks when it comes out of the ground. And I have to soak this and um, strain it to get all the roots and rocks and everything so I can have a smooth um, polish. So it's really two different colors of clay. The red clay that you, that is, that you make the, the pot out of. Yeah. And then this gray colored clay that you use to paint with. Yeah. I think one of the things that is a little bit confusing is when, you know, when we talk to customers about the pots are painted, they assume that you go to Home Depot and you buy a gallon of terracotta <laughs> red and you paint it onto the surface. But that's not the case at all. No. Paint in your case means watery clay. Yeah. Or watery minerals. Yeah, and I apply probably about four or five layers of this. In, be in between, I let it kind of um, set as I apply the layers, and then I will stone polish it. Your pots seem to have a really nice glow about that. Is that the result of the stone polishing? Yes, it is. And it takes years to learn how to really stone, know how to learn how to stone polish, especially the red um, parts, the red paint. So when you say stone polishing, basically you're saying you take a rock and you rub it on the outside of the pot? Yes. Till it shines. Uh-huh. And if you don't do it right? Um, and also, um, I have a white slip that I use, which is also a gray clay, but dug in a different pit. And then I have to mix some um, the juice from a white sand, where I'll wash the white sand and mix it in and I have to get that just right, because if I put too much white sand in there, then it, when I go to stone polish it, then it'll just rub off. And then if I don't have enough, then when I fire it, it turns out this kind of like ugly pinkish color. Huh. <laughs> so. Well, and that one, that, that's why a lot of the Zia potters, they use the gray slip more because they don't know how to mix the paint, the white paint, the white slip. I learned how to do that when my mom was still alive. She taught me how to mix it right. So you have to be a chemist? Yeah, and, you kind and of a geologist. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. And an artist and a painter. And uh, it's really 
far more complicated. Is that your second coat? This is my second coat. If you don't put enough coats of this um, gray slip on it, what will the red clay show through? The red clay will show through. Now, slip is merely a word that means watery clay. Yes. Now, obviously, uh, 300 years ago at Zia Pueblo, you couldn't go to the craft store and buy that nice big fat brush that you had. Oh, no. What, that, did, what did people use then? Well, we used to use, and I for used that when I first started doing pottery, was a piece of um, um, sheep fur. Oh, uh huh. You know, cut up uh, when we butchered a sheep, we would save the hide or whatever, you know, and um, we'd use that for our, our brush to put the slip on. But wow. we've gotten a little modern now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little easier going to Michael's yeah. brush store and buying the. The big fat brush is there. Yeah. Now, do you have to wait until that slip dries before you can begin to polish? Yeah, this, after I finish, see I'm letting it kind of set uh -huh. where it's not too wet um, in between layers. Uh huh. And um, anyway, the final, um, like the fourth um, layer that I put on, I'll let that dry um, pretty much completely. Um, usually when I'm at home, I'll use my hair dryer, my blow dryer, <laughs> <laughs> to make it dry yeah, faster. Yeah, I think maybe 300 years ago, they had <laughs> blow dryers there too. I think it's called the wind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my grandma used to, um, She when she was... Um, uh, doing her pottery when she was painting, I mean, putting her slip on, she would um, actually do it outside the house and let the um, wind and the sun dry the slip. Yeah. Yes, when the, the river was the washing machine and the clothesline was the dryer. Yeah. It looks like you're putting it on so evenly. I guess it's practice. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. when you make pots, you don't dig the clay for one and then make one pot and then paint the slip on it and then paint it and fire it. You have lots of them going at the same yeah. time. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh huh. And how many pieces do you have going at the same time? Oh, probably about 20 pieces at one time. Um, you know, different stages, especially this year with COVID. You know, um, being stuck at home, you've got to have something to do. So instead of putting my pottery aside and stuff like that, you know, since, you know, we don't have no art shows or anything, you know, um, I just decided, well, I'll just keep making pottery. They're not going to get rotten, you know, <laughs> they're not right. going to spoil, they're just going to sit there, you know, so I've kept up with making pottery. I'll, you know, do a few and let them dry and then I'll mix some more clay and make a few different shapes, sizes, you so know. So you have all your pots in various stages of completion. Some are just the uncleaned raw clay. Uh -huh. Some are the clean clay. Yeah. Some are um, coiled but not dry. Some are dry with slip. 
yeah. and some are painted and some are fired and ready to put a price tag on them. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, if um, I don't let this slip dry to, you know, almost all the way, if I start polishing it when it's wet, then I'll get um, what they call um, crazing, um, where you'll get little hairline cracks crack. on the surface. Yeah. So that's why I let them dry completely. So I won't get that crazy. And with the red slip, the red um, paint, that one I have to polish it in order to, um, when it's still pretty damp. And um, that way I can get that high shine to it. It'll be that, um, uh, the tan colored um, color yeah. right here. The it coffee, turned, the coffee with lots and yeah, lots and lots, lots, lots of, of cream. cream in it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, when you when you made pots, you might have this slip ready to uh, put on the pots, and so you might paint a half a dozen pots. Yeah, uh -huh. I'll, I'll go ahead if I have, you know, several pots that are ready, I'll go ahead and slip all the um, background, the gray slip, I'll pol stone polish all of them, and then I'll go ahead and do some, the bottom part, which is this red, and these are my stones that I use here. This where, one, where did you get those stones? This one belonged to my um, husband's grandma. Huh. It was, I found it um, when we were cleaning up the yard, there was this wooden box in there and we were taking all the, there was, you know, a lot of trash and stuff like that and we were taking them out. And I found this one and it was, there was some metal in there and the metal was rusted. So the, it had kind of gotten on the rock, so I cleaned it off and everything. So this is my, my polishing stone now. <laughs> and this one belonged to my mom here. When I first started doing pottery, she gave me this one. She gave me a couple of them, uh, this one and a little bit smaller one that I use on my designs. And this one is a river rock that I found. And I've dropped it several times. I don't know if you see it, but I've broken it in half and I liquid nailed it back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this one I use on the design to polish the small parts like here and right in here. So those are my polishing stones. A long time ago, Tina Garcia, who is from Santa Clara Pueblo, told me that her four-year-old ate two of her polishing stones. Oh. <laughs> and I mean, the, the, the child could have been in big trouble, but luckily they came through. And she said that she had to go rescue those pot those polishing stones because uh, polishing stones are just so so important. In yeah. fact, uh, one of the comments what, that I heard once was that polishing stones are like box seats at the San Francisco Opera House. Yeah. You don't buy them; you inherit them. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, in fact, um, the smaller one that my mom gave me, I lost that for a long time. I didn't know what happened to it. It just so happened that my daughter, when, when she was small, we used to 
have this jar, like a water jar, that, um, you know, those water fountain drinks. Anyway, we, we would save all our coins, you know, and um, she put it in there. And when it got full, I went and um, uh, emptied it out and started rolling the coins. And lo and behold, my polishing stone was in there. I don't know how many years it was in there, huh. but it was in there. <laughs> so well, I was like, oh, my so yuck. <laughs> I'm sure she thought it was just as valuable or more valuable than money. Yeah. And that's where it belongs. Put it in the uh -huh. bank. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see, this one I have to let it dry. It's starting to dry now. And you should have brought your hair dryer. I know, I should have brought my blow dryer. Yeah. I, we, I don't think we have one here. <laughs> At least I hope not. <laughs> so Ruby, what's your favorite part about making pots? Uh, just building them up. Seeing, you know, like, like I said, I like to experiment, see how far I can stretch my clay, what shapes I can, you know, make. I made one, um, what you call it, like a bird effigy kind of um, pot. Um, my daughter has that one. <laughs> and that was the only one I did. And... Um, in fact, one um, uh, piece I actually made kind of like a storyteller. When I first started doing pottery, I thought I was going to get try storytellers, but that didn't work out. <laughs> but a local collector still has it in his, his collection here in Santa Fe. One of a kind. Yeah, one, one of, of a, a kind. kind. Yeah. And so also, uh, pottery making can be very difficult on your hands. Um, it is. Is there something that you do that takes care of your hands? Or how do you, how do you care for your hands because you're in the clay all the time? Uh, a lot of the times my hands are so dry, but I um, use a lot of lotion. And also what I do is when I'm working, you know, making pottery, I let my dishes pile up, so. <laughs> Is that the excuse? <laughs> <laughs> so I let, so, you know, when, when I get through working with clay, I, I'll go wash my dishes and it cleans a lot of the clay off and, because it gets into your pores and everything. And, uh, but I've got a friend that makes some special lotion for me. So my hands aren't all cracked and everything like that. So, yeah, I, I know if you ever go to a, a spa, um, and there's one place is slightly north of here called Ojo Caliente. Yeah. They have mud baths. And you get into this big, huge sort of pool of slip, watery clay, and you sit in that mud bath, and then when you come out, you lay down on one of their lounges and you dry in the sun. Uh -huh. It is so, you look at your skin and you look like you've aged 200 <laughs> years because it's all so dry and wrinkled. And so your hands get that same mud bath every single oh, day babe. that you work, yeah. on, work with clay. Yeah. And I'm sure it just, all, every bit of natural oil that that might be there just comes, you know, just it comes right just out. It dries out, yeah. you know. Um, I'm not too bad right now, but when I'm, you know, like doing a lot of shows, my hands will be so dry. But if you uh, use lanolin, I was told, that's probably a really good idea. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, like I said, my friend makes this special lotion for me. Oh, nice. um, she uses a lot of um, herbal, mm -hmm. um, uh, like, um, what do you call it? The cedar, 
um, the seeds. Uh -huh. She uses juniper that. Juniper berries? Or huh? Are they juniper berries? Juniper berries. Uh -huh. Like that. She uses that. And it's all like um, Chinese herbal medicine, you know, that she does. And she makes that lotion for me. Well, when you start painting pagodas on your pot, well, I know that you get maybe a little too much of that lotion. <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. So is the pot almost dry? Just about. It's oh, yeah, you can there. see how it's drying up. Yeah. Well, breathe hard. And how many layers of slip did you put on it? I put four. Is that, is that normal? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the bigger ones like this, I usually put five, six, you know, layers on. And um, like I said, I let it dry between each layer. Because if you start putting it on right one layer after another, you know, before letting it sit, then it'll just rub, rub off the, you'll just pull the slip off. And uh, do you have to polish the entire pot in one go, or can you leave it for a section? Um, I usually do all the whole pot. I, I sit there and just work on it till I finish it. Because sometimes if you let it, let it sit, um, if like now, if I don't polish it, then um, it gets, I guess, too dry. And then when I go to stone polish it, then it um, tends to just rub off instead of getting that shine to it. Well, good deal, Ruby. It's been really fun so far having you. I just want to tell people if they would like to communicate directly with Ruby at this point, all they have to do is send an email to zoom, Z-O-O-M, at andreafisherpottery.com, and you'll be able to speak with Ruby directly. Again, that's zoom, Z-O-O-M, at andreafisherpottery.com. Well, are we going to... At some point today, are we going to take a lunch break? I think that would be wise. Yeah. After all, we don't want Ruby to pass out. <laughs> I see that you have all sorts of little plastic tubs on your on the table, Ruby. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what what they are. That's not your lunch, is it? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, let's see. Like I said, this is my gray slip. slip. And here in this one, I have my red slip, my red paint. This is the way it comes out of the ground. This is this one right here. And then this is my black paint the way it comes out of the ground. And what, what, what is the black? It's kind of like a rock, sandstone rock, but huh. it's not really sandstone. It's kind of... Um, uh, so it's not clay? It's, it's kind of clayish. You can tell. But it's black? Yeah. Huh. That's, that's really, you know, unusual. And, and then I make a, what you call it, a paste out of the bee plant. Uh huh. Um, I take the whole, whole bee plant, I pull it out by the root. Yeah, a bee, and, a bee plant is a wild spinach. Wild spinach. That grows here in New Mexico, and it's called bee plant because the bees like it too. Yeah. Anyway, I make a paste uh, so you, out of you that. So you cook it? You cook it? I cook it completely down till it's all mushy, all the root, the stem, everything. I cook it down, and after it's all mushy and everything, when it's completely cooked, then I strain it, and then I um, reboil it again.
until it comes into a real thick paste. And um, I laid that one out on, um, what do you call it, corn husks, mm -hmm. and let it dry on the corn husks. And that acts as the binder for my black paint. Uh -huh. to, so it, it'll stick onto the pottery. Well, you know that uh, <laughs> spinach has lots of iron in it. Uh, yeah. And so more than likely it's iron oxide. Uh huh. And when iron oxide is heated, it turns black. Yeah. And so um, that's where the black coloration comes from. Have you noticed that the, um, the, the spinach that you cook down can be different shades of black and brown? Uh huh. Yeah. And that depends on, you know, where, where you get where the, you, Where you get it and What how, kind of dirt it's growing in. Yeah, and then how mature if you use, um, where the, it's already flowering, it'll come out um, like a darker color. Uh huh. So what I usually do is um, I wait till the flowers start coming out and um, then I pick it. So you, you make all these paints and all the slips by hand. Yeah. And you make a lot of them in, in one group? Uh, uh, yeah. And, I, then, and then keep them? Will they keep forever? They'll keep forever. I keep them in a plastic container mm -hmm. and they don't spoil. Um, so I keep them in, covered in a plastic container after it's completely dry. Um, and um, I'll just take a piece off whenever I need it. And um, anyway, so those are my different paints, my basic paints that I use. And then this is the um, brown. I don't think uh -huh. I have it the brown color. It's a mixture of my red, the red slip mixed with the black. And that's how I get my brown, mm -hmm. kind of like a brownish color. And this is my red paint here that's already all cleaned. This is ready for me to use. Uh -huh. By, by clean, you mean no seeds or no, or no seeds, roots no or? roots, no rocks, nothing, the sand, because uh -huh. there is sand in there. And um, so I soak this and then put it through a real fine strainer, uh -huh. a curtain, curtain, an old curtain. So this is my red here. And then this is my black paint that's ready to use. Wow. Yeah. This is already all mixed with the, um, the hummingbird mm -hmm. um, plant and this, the rocks here. That's all ready to use. And right here, this is my demonstration uh, rock. This is what I carry around with me when I'm going to demonstrate. This is where I put my black paint and mix it here. So you take a chunk off and then grind it up yeah. and mix it with water. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is where I put my black paint uh -huh. and this is my rock that I use to mix mm -hmm. in. I've got my um, grandma's um, um, black paint stone. It's a uh, this one I just had it made. Um, one of my husband's cousins is a stone sculptor, and I had him when I started doing demonstrations. I didn't want to carry my grandmother's big stone around with me because it's it's thinner than this, and if I drop it, that's, you know, yeah. 
it, I'm going to lose a precious piece, yeah, you broken know. broken memories. Me lots of memories, you know. It belonged to my grandma, and so I don't take it out of the house. So I just used that one that my, co my husband's cousin made for me. This part, I, this one belonged to my mom. This, um, this is the one that she used to use. And anyway, I carry this one around with me, too. That one I can't break. <laughs> I don't think. Maybe I might. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're really set up for a windy day. With uh -huh. all those rocks in your pocket, you don't I have know, to worry really. about blowing away. <laughs> well, so what, what you're telling me over this time period that we've been doing this, to be an authentic Native American potter, you have to have an old pizza pan, uh -huh. um, a, a kitchen knife, a broken cup, some Tupperware containers, um, a, a paintbrush from the craft store, or uh, a sheep uh, that needs to be slaughtered so that you can use its fur for a, a, a paintbrush, and, um, and lots of available clay and rocks. Yep. Sounds perfect. I know. <laughs> what more do you need? You don't what need to go to the need? store. You don't need to go to the store. Maybe you'll invest $3 in that brush, but that's about it. Yeah. Wow. And so how's your pot coming along? It's pretty much dry. I just uh -huh. wiped it off to get uh -huh. any leftover like sand, fine sand, just to kind of smooth it before the gray slip, they didn't use to um, stone polish it. They used to just take a real fine rag and just start rubbing it. Uh -huh. And, um, but it was kind of like um, doll color. Yeah. And when I started doing pottery, then I started stone polishing them. And in the <laughs> old days, that rag might be like a chamois. Uh, yeah. A piece of skin or uh -huh. hide, I guess I should say, yeah. not skin. Skin assumes that it's still <laughs> stuck on someone or something. But, uh, but hide or, or uh, uh, and you would use that for your, your polishing yeah. instead. Or, or rock. Oh gosh, we're getting more complicated with our tools now. I we know. Need, now we need a piece of hide as well. I know, really. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's pretty much dry. And what I do is I have to get wet my fingers because my fingers are so slippery from being dry. So I start going back and forth with my rock. And as you can see, as I go, it's getting shiny. And I have to keep it going like this till I polish the whole thing. you can see right there.
So Ruby, how many times do you polish these guys? Just once? Just once. Yeah, just the one time. Uh, I do know that Santa Clara Potter has polished six, seven, eight times. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, wow. I'm glad I don't have to do that. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's hard work. You have to do the whole thing at once. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes when you're sitting there polishing, your fingers start cramping on you, and you have to stop after you finish a piece and just rest your hands. Yeah.
Oh, good. I'm almost through here. No, just the one time. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. I love love wraps. Okay, we could do that. Yeah. Do you want fries with that? Uh, or coleslaw. Uh, coleslaw. sheen you'll be kind of dull uh -huh. and as you go along you you're when you're polishing this part it'll be harder to polish oh so you put the paint the paint which is the colored clay uh -huh. or the the minerals on top of that polished surface and then you polish what you've painted yeah and do you polish it like you're polishing it now, or do you polish each little color individually? I polish each different That's color. why that polishing stone, yeah. that other polishing stone you yeah. have is so little? Yeah, I use uh, this one for mostly the slip, because it's bigger, you know, and you cover mm -hmm. more area. And then I use this one for the red um, paint. Uh -huh. you know, the bottom, and then this one for the little areas that I need to polish. 
So that is just an ordinary stone. This that is came just from the, the rock. river, probably. Yeah. How come you don't? It's not all streaky. What do you mean streaky? Well, it was streaks in it. So uh -huh. that some parts are shinier than others, and oh, and I try to go cold. back and get every part of it, so it won't be streaky. <laughs> and then it depends on your stone too, uh -huh. the surface, you know. This one's kind of flat, so it's, you know, polishes more evenly, so I don't get the streaks in it. Now, is that your grandma's stone? Uh, I imagine it was. I, I know my mom was the one that gave mm -hmm. me this one. So I imagine it probably was my grandma's stone. <laughs> Because all these rocks, like I said, are the, um, a lot of the things are inherited from one generation to another. And then sometimes I'll go for a walk down by the river, you know, I'll pick up a stone. And uh, even though that's kind of rough when I pick it up, uh, since I'm working with like um, kind of sand or whatever, it makes the stone get smoother. And then plus that, all the oils from your hands, it turns it smoother. Do you have oils in your hands? <laughs> One little <laughs> bit, the <laughs> stone <laughs> sucks it <laughs> out. <laughs> it must be all those Chinese herbs that are in there. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When you are painting your designs on, do you draw the designs on ahead of time? I, parts of it, I, you know, kind of like rough it in. Uh -huh. Like um, the rainbow and uh -huh. the bird, I'll rough that in. You know, just real, just so I can kind of even it out. Comes your helper again. Yeah, you abandoned me. Oh. There, it's all polished. Wow, wow. <laughs> you could almost fire it like that. Huh? You could almost fire it like that. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, there is one potter from Laguna that um, his name is Andrew Padilla. Uh, he just takes his pieces that far and he fires them and the slip that he uses fires out white. Oh, so really? he makes these pure white pots with no designs. No designs? At all. What are you doing? I'm putting my <laughs> <laughs> Kind of making a line where I'm gonna, oh. so my red isn't all. Aha, uh -huh, aha. Uh -huh. So the, what, that's what I do. I put it at the edge of the table and put my pencil there, and um, I kind of make a line, a guideline, you would say. Kind of went crooked here. There, that's my guideline for my red. Oh, uh -huh. So I'm ready to put my red polish on, my red paint. Your red paint. Uh -huh. Yeah. And what you want to tell us again what the red paint is made from? 
It's a clay. It's dug out. Um, actually, we get it um, right here by Cochiti. Pueblo. Oh, is it different than it's different than the red clay you use? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a lot different. It's um, I don't know what I you would say, but it's like a red clay. It's a different, completely different clay than the, what I use for my pots itself. You can see the difference. The yeah, the difference in the color. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wow. So this is what my clay comes out. I mean, my paint comes out from uh -huh. the ground. And then, like I said, I strain it and everything. And um, that's my background slip. I mean, my slip for the bottom. And then also for my other parts of my designs. Huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> nice straight lines. You've done that before. Probably thousands of times. Uh huh. How, how many putts do you think you might have made in your life so far? I'm not even sure. Well, how many do you make a year, roughly? Sort of. Maybe at 100? Well, then you must be bringing them all to us. We're <laughs> pretty close. Or maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You know, this, I, like I said, I do different sizes. Uh -huh. And I also do um, a lot of, um, I get orders from the Pueblo uh -huh. for ceremonial uses. Mm -hmm. So I'm always busy doing you know, like chili bowls and pots for uh, for them to use for water and stuff like that. Well, I would think that with a lot of ceremonies that happen in the, the Pueblo and there are only, what did you say, seven uh -huh. potters? That, yeah. Uh, they're probably pretty busy doing things for the Pueblo. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, I think there was this new book on pottery that was coming out. It came out yesterday. Really? It's available on Amazon, I think it is. And what's it uh, called? It's called um, Modern Potters or Zia or something like that. Um, but there's only five of us that are featured in that book. Wow. Um, myself, Eleanor, my sister, uh -huh. you remember Eleanor? Oh yeah. And um, the Medinas, um, mm -hmm. Lois, I mean not Lois, Liz yeah. and Marcellos. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, Diana Lucero uh -huh. and Erlinda Lucero. Huh. Diane Lucero, she live at, at, at uh, Jemez? No, she lives down in San Ysidro. She makes storytellers? No, oh, she does. Oh, this is a different Diane Lucero then. Yeah, that, you're that thinking I of know. a different one. No, this is, um, she's a girl from Zia, but married to a Spanish guy. Mm. from San Ysidro, which is like about yeah. four miles down the road. She's a cousin of mine. Um, her mom, I don't know, you probably heard of her, Vicentita Pino. Uh-huh. That, that's her mom. Oh. And so anyway, she started doing pottery too. So she's been doing it for a few years now. No, the, the most common names at at, uh, at Zia are 
Medina and Pino. Any others? Um, Gauchipins. Gauchipins. Uh huh. And Shihais. Yeah, there's um, one other lady that's doing it, doing pottery. Um, Isavia, she hates. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, but she, I guess she didn't want to get interviewed for the book. Oh, she does really nice work. Yeah. But we like you, Ruby, that's why you're here. Yay. <laughs> Oh, that just looks like it's perfect. Now, do you have to wait for that to dry? Just a little bit where uh -huh. the clay sets, the red, I have to polish it when it's still damp oh. in order to get that. And that, that, this is something you learned from uh, your mama? Yeah. Uh-huh. Because each uh, material has its own mood. And personality. Yeah. <laughs> you usually don't take the hair dryer to the red? Not to the red. Well, I was just informed by uh, one of my employees that there are 200,000 people in the East Coast that don't have any power. Oh, really? Because oh, of because hurricane. of the hurricane? Uh-huh, because of the hurricane. Wow. I mean, there's a tropical storm right now going on in the middle of Manhattan. Oh, wow. Here's a question from Daniel. Uh-huh. Um, Daniel wants to know if the stone polishing actually removes some of the dried slip. Um, and is there a fine powder that comes off when you polish? A what? They, he wants to know that what, if, if you're polishing, uh, does any of the slip that you've painted on, does it come off? No. Uh, no, no. But so your polishing is forcing the slip into it's the clay Into body the clay. Rather than it being something that lays on the surface. Yeah. Okay. It becomes part of the pot itself. So it's, there's, there's no powder or anything no. that comes off? Well, Daniel, I hope, um, Daniel from California, I hope that answers your question. And so what you're doing is you're fusing the wet clay um, to the dry pot by polishing, by, by pushing it into the, the dry pot when you polish, if that makes any sense. Or yeah. Okay. Okay, well, Daniel, I uh, hope that answers your question. I think there's going to be lots of fun to come because I think the most exciting part to watch is someone as skilled as Ruby uh, do her painting. We saw how she put that um, red slip on the bottom and these absolutely perfect lines. Such steadiness and such control is just truly amazing. And now that red bottom is getting just as shiny as the what will turn out to be that sort of beige color background uh, that uh, she polished earlier. But to see that steady hand and so comfortably to, to draw the lines and to make the designs, I mean, it's just, I find it really amazing. And one thing, I don't know if you noticed, I 
have to keep licking my finger. I don't really have any fingerprints anymore. From, really? Yeah, from... Oh, let's you know, go the, rob a bank. The, I know, <laughs> from sanding, you know, the uh -huh. rough and working with the clay. I've pretty much... You've pretty much worn your fingerprints off. Uh -huh. huh. So that's huh. why I have to keep licking my fingers so I can hold on to the polishing rock. So if there are any crimes committed and they can't find any fingerprints, do they have to go... Look for potters. I know, really. <laughs> potters will make good, what to call yeah, it, bank they... robbers. <laughs> <laughs> no fingerprints, huh? I never thought about that. Yeah. Well, all that skin on your hands must be very new and, and soft. Uh -huh. Because uh, you keep wearing away the old dead stuff on the top. I know, really. <laughs> Yeah, the second time when I'm polishing, the first time I just lightly stone polish it just to get it on there. And then the second time, then I'm really putting, you know. Lots of pressure. Pressure on it to uh -huh. um, get it to come out really shiny. It's amazing what the combination of a rock and a dirt, I mean, rock and dirt, what it can turn into. <laughs> yeah. I know some of the younger ones that, um, try to do pottery if they don't know how to really stone polish they'll mostly like on the stew bowls and the dough uh -huh. bowls they'll just cloth polish it but it's not the real high shine yeah. it's kind of like a dull shine to it they'll just take the cloth like mine a uh -huh. real soft cloth and then they'll just keep rubbing it and rubbing it kind of like a buffer kind of thing. Uh -huh. Now you were telling me earlier that you planted a lot of gourds in your garden and that you paint the gourds. Do you do any kind of polishing or um, anything at all like that on the gourds? No, uh, no, no uh, that, that I use commercial paint for, uh, but I uh, draw the traditional designs on there. You know, almost like a little piece of pottery, but using commercial paint. Uh-huh. I like to try different things. For a while there, I was etching glass. Oh, uh-huh. Just to stay busy. <laughs> Keep there from go. going crazy. Well, Ruby, what do you do for fun? <laughs> What do you do for fun? I don't know. Make pottery. Make pottery, huh? Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like fun to me. It looks like a lot of hard work. No, it's fun. Now, have you, do you, have you taught any kids or you, do you have children of your own? I've got one daughter. Oh, the daughter that's going to, is a nurse? Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, she's the only one I have, and she knows how to do pottery. Just that she just doesn't have time. Who has time, yeah. Yeah. So now what are you up to? Now I finished polishing. I'm just buffing it up a little uh -huh. bit. And there, it's all polished. There you go. 
There you go. Nice That's ready job. for painting. It's really beautiful. It's a beautiful shape, too. Yeah. And then always, you most of the time before I start painting, I itch my name on there on the bottom. Because uh -huh. otherwise I'll forget. <laughs> You forget your name? Yeah, you know, I forget to put my name <laughs> oh, on my pot. I forget pot. to put your name on the pot. I thought yeah. maybe you were being no. your name. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, so that's all ready for painting right now. Well, is this a good time to talk a little bit about some of the pots you have for sale? Sure. Or do you want to, are you, why don't you finish polishing so that when we come back then you can start, you know, painting rainbows and birds and uh -huh. all those other wonderful things that you do. All those lovely berries that the birds are going to eat and the, and the clouds and the feathers and yay. Oh. Do you paint the inside of the rim? Inside the inside the rim? No, I used to. Um, I know we used to put like red paint right there. Uh huh. And I don't know when when I lost that tradition of putting the red uh -huh. on there. I know there there were some people that complained, saying that. Um, if I paint it red in there, that I was just trying to cover up the fact that maybe I might be using commercial clay. Oh. So I think that's why I quit doing that. Yeah, because commercial clay doesn't look the same. No. No. And, no, not And you at can all. O often tell commercial clay because it has this sort of pinky color yeah. to it. I mean, it, the color is just wrong. Yeah. Uh, because they're not at Zia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're on the clay. I know there's a couple of girls in Zia that um, they're part Zia, part Acoma. Uh huh. And um, they, they do pottery, but they use, I think, commercial clay, the white, uh -huh. and they just paint the inside of the pot to make it look red. Yeah. So it's like, you know, yeah. you're cheating there. It's not real Zia pottery. Well, you know, that's one of the things that we strive for is to make sure that <coughs> every piece that we have in here is handmade, you know, yeah. from digging the clay all the way up to up to the firing process. Because, you know, some <coughs> pieces are no longer uh, ground fired, and part of the reason is is that the buying public has dictated some of that. I know that at Acoma, that if you do a ground firing and the flames have an opportunity to to touch the pot they'll they'll make the pot look gray in that area and that's true i'm sure with zia yeah. pots as well um you know there's a very lovely sort of romantic name for that which is a, a fire cloud yes yeah. it's, it's as though you know, the hand of God came down and touched the fire and, the, and it left this very shadowy mark behind. But some of the buying public looks at that and says, oh, look at that mistake. Yeah. And it, and it you know, it isn't really a mistake. It's just part, part of the of process. And consequently, Acoma went to almost exclusively doing kiln-fired um, pieces of pottery. Because first of all, it's a lot of work between gathering the wood and building the fire and gathering the cow pies and you wind up smelling like a cow pie. I don't smoke. 
<laughs> when they're done. Uh, the, and then you run the risk of the flames licking the pot. Uh, and so it isn't as, I guess, desirable by the person who wants to display it on their mantle um, if it has a fire cloud on it. And I love the fire clouds because I really think that Mother Nature's had a hand in helping yeah. you out. And, and this is her way of saying, you know, this is my contribution. And especially in Hopi pots, I mean, I, they wouldn't have to paint one single line on their piece of pottery and just have the fire clouds. Uh, I think, you know, they're really, really beautiful. But, you know, then again, you know, potters have to make a living. And if it's harder to sell the ones with fire clouds on them, uh, then that's choices that you have to make. Yeah. And also speaking of um, the public dictating, you know, our pottery, our traditional Zia pots that we used to use for carrying water on our heads, mm -hmm. they will be concave. Uh -huh. But then they won't sit straight. You know, so we started doing the flat bottoms, uh -huh. so to sell to the public. Yeah. But if we're going to really use it at the Pueblo and not care if it's going to sit like this, you know, like half drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would have so, been stored in those pots, yeah. Ruby. <laughs> yeah. So we, you know, we put that concave bottom uh -huh. still on so we can because it'll fit like your, yeah, the that, shape of your there's, head. There's no one in Zia with a flat head. No. <laughs> <laughs> At least we hope not. <laughs> yeah, so the public kind of dictated that for us to, and I know one guy said, it's not traditional because it doesn't have to concave. Yeah. I said, well, that's, you know, the public kind of, they wanted their pottery to sit flat, you know? So we went to the flat bottoms. Well, I think that is a little bit of um, a compromise uh -huh. uh, with, with the buyer to yeah. have that nice flat bottom instead of the round bottom because it really doesn't affect um, the rest of the traditional no, designs or, or the process. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's just, it's a little glitch along the way, and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, so. Mr. Derek, are you around? Yes. I think. Oh, has Ruby's oh, look? Uh, oh, there we go. Well, Ruby's going to have a little lunch, but I'll probably talk to you a little bit. During that time period, I'd love to talk about some of her pieces. I think that would be great fun. And, uh, and a little bit more about Zia and, and the fact that the state of New Mexico uh, helped itself to a lot of the Zia symbols, which we now have in, in various places. So Ruby, enjoy your lunch. Okay. And uh, we'll be back shortly. Hmm? Well, maybe, maybe we can move over to uh, Ruby's Pots. Well, let's go take a look at a bunch sure. of them. Oh, okay. This is the guy that did that book. A 
Rosia Pueblo just came out today, Ruby? Was it today? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday, hot off the press. And Ruby is one of the featured potters in that book. Uh, we're delighted to give them a plug because anything anyone can learn about pottery, as far as we are concerned, is a step in the right direction. Anyway, let's move pot that you're seeing over here, the pot that you're seeing over here in the corner uh, is the one that Ruby made this morning. And we were lucky enough to see that whole process. If you notice, there's something strange at the bottom that looks kind of white. That's called a pookie. And a pookie is the form in which they um, begin making a, a piece of pottery. Some people use, oh, like a plastic bowl, which Ruby has done. Some people use a basket. And sometimes even the impression of the woven basket uh, will be left at the bottom of the pot. And the pot is made from the clay that was dug at Zia Pueblo, this nice sort of dark red. And if you've ever gone up into the Jemez, mountains in that direction, all the hills are that sort of same, same color. And with the green trees and the blue sky and the sun shining on everything, it's really, really quite beautiful. Um, the pot was made by the coil method. And um, the, the coil method is merely a way of um, make, doing a hand-built pot. None, none of the pots of rubies, or in fact, none of the pots in this gallery, is made by another method. Um, not, um, not wheel thrown or not molded in any way. So what she did this morning is she rolled out these big, fat, thick rolls of, of, of clay, stacked them on top of each other, and then and then um, she smoothed the pots as she went. As, as, she, as she built the pots up, she started with uh, a form that, I mean, a shape that sort of looked like a cylinder. And, and with uh, a broken coffee cup, <laughs> I just love it, she smoothed out the pot to uh, make this wonderful form. Now, this pot is going to sit here, and it's going to dry, oh, probably for a couple hours while she um, shows us some other things. And then she'll take this pot and begin the process of sanding it and smoothing it even more. Now, she came also with a pot that was at that stage. It was sanded and smoothed and completely dry. And um, while this demonstration was going on, she, she got that pot that she brought with her, and she painted on slip, which is watery clay. Now, the slip clay is different than the actual clay in, the, in this piece of pottery. The slip is a gray-colored, here we go. Now you can see it. It's a gray color. It almost looks like a rock. And she mixes it with water. Um, it's been sanded. I mean, it's been sifted over and over again until it's really, really fine. And uh, then with a, a big, fat, soft brush, she painted it onto the surface. And she painted it over and over and over again. Now, when this pot fires, that gray slip is going to be the same background color that you see in all of her pots that are here. Um, when, when chemicals heat, oftentimes they change color. And 
In this particular case, this gray that you see now will become that sort of caramel, um, light beige color that is um, the background for Ruby's pots. She also did the red slip on the bottom of the pot. Uh, and at this angle, you can't see it very well, but if you look at her pieces that are in the display, oh, here we go, now you can, there we go. Now you can see that dark red edge, but if you look at the pieces in the display, they all have that traditional red bottom. Uh, one of the ways of knowing that this is definitely a Zia pot. Um, when Ruby comes back from lunch, oh, oh, and after she painted on this gray slip, I forgot one part, um, with a river stone, one that her mother gave her, that belonged to her grandmother, because polishing stones are really, really important. And, you know, after a long time of use, they flatten out, they, um, they become smoother and smoother because they originally were polished, the stones were originally polished them themselves by the water that flows in the river that's right near Zio Puebla, making the rocks really, really smooth. And so you can use that smooth rock on the smooth surface of the pot and by polishing, you're forcing the clay, the slip clay, the slip, the watery clay, the gray part, into the body of the red pot. So they fuse and become one, and they become your nice, clean, smooth, shiny surface on which you can paint the designs. And if you notice, uh, Ruby's pots, have a look all of their own. Um, you can look at them and say, A, they're from Zia, and definitely they are Ruby's pots because where there are birds on the pots, um, and you can see two types of birds. One, one bird is a roadrunner, and yes, we have roadrunners, in New Mexico, and if you ever watched cartoons as a kid and saw the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote, uh, the Roadrunner was definitely the winner in that engagement, even though coyotes are very, um, what you might say, uh, easy, uh, e well, they're very sly themselves, but the Roadrunner somehow can always sort of outfox them. And, and you will see roadrunners in New Mexico, and they're fairly decent sized bird, maybe a, a foot, foot and a half tall, and they're sort of gray and nondescript. And they'll, and if you're driving along a back road somewhere, they'll be just running down the road right next to your car. It's really, really interesting. But the roadrunner is the predominant bird in all of Ruby's pots. The other bird that you see that has the hooked beak and the bigger, fatter wings and a, and a much broader tail is a parrot. And e parrots don't hang out in New Mexico anymore. And, you know, just like any other art form, you um, paint or you design or you use the symbols of the animals or, the, or the, the animals that you have in your environment uh, or the landscape. Uh, I went to China many years ago and you see all those Chinese silk screens with all those mountains that look like pointy ice cream cones. Well, I got to China and there were all those pointy ice cream cone mountains. I couldn't believe it. But um, just like the, the pointy ice cream cones, the, um, the birds and the rainbows on her pots are what a Zia person, uh, since there was a Zia Pueblo, would see in their environment. But the parrot's a little different because the parrot is, is the, um, the design is the product of climate change. 
Uh, the parrots used to live in this area. The parrots were used for trading. Their feathers were really important in all the various um, ceremonies that the Native Americans did. But the parrot, uh, when the climate changed, they went south, but the design stayed behind. And that's why you will see parrots on Native American pots, even though parrots don't live in this area. I love the idea that Ruby has rainbows on all of her pots because the weather here in New Mexico, and I feel badly for all those people on the East Coast that are getting hammered by uh, the hurricane, uh, but the, pair, the rainbow is something that we see very, very often here in, in New Mexico. Uh, we get really very strange storms. Um, the wind blows, the sky is perfectly blue. Then the wind starts to blow a little bit. And then all of a sudden these black clouds come rushing in. It's as though someone turned on the faucet in the car wash and all the water comes dumping down on us and then it moves on. But because the landscape is the way it is and, you can, and the air is so clear here and you can see for a million miles, if you are between the place where the sun is shining and where the storm is happening, um, that uh, the, the rays of light that go through the rain uh, are refract, refracted and you get to see these enormous full rainbows in the sky. I can understand why, you know, the myth of the pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow because they're really sort of tantalizing to see this color in the sky. And then we're lucky enough um, oftentimes to get double rainbows, one rainbow inside the other. And on occasion, a few occasions, I've even seen a triple rainbow. But if you notice on Ruby's pots, there are some with single rainbows and with double rainbows. And the Zia uh, people also have a sun symbol. And I don't see a sun symbol on any of Ruby's pots here. But if you look on the New Mexican state flag, the sun symbol is what is in the center of the, of the flag. Um, a circle with the sun in the four directions. And so from Zia, uh, the state of New Mexico took their sun symbol and put it on the flag. And um, the state of New Mexico also took the Roadrunner, which is pretty prominent up in their area, or prolific, I should say, and that became our state bird. Now, Ruby's pieces um, are wonderful. You can see that, you know, we're just getting a little natural light from outside and a little bit of overhead light, but um, the, the pots really glisten. Even the one she just polished, you can see the way the, the light reflects off of it. And what she told me was that when she paints on the, the colored clays, because that's effectively what the paints are made of. They're not something that you buy at the hardware store. Um, they are colored clays. And when you paint that colored clay on top of the polished clay, it's sort of like the contrast between the two pots, the ones that are not finished that we saw earlier. That, that color clay does not shine. And so after that color clay begins to dry, with a, a small polishing stone, Ruby polishes painstakingly, tediously, polishes those rainbows and those birds that are on her pots. Now, Ruby makes a variety of sizes in pieces. And you know, these smaller pieces are really wonderful. They range about $95. And then the prices go up from there. And um, you can imagine, with all, with all of the work, what the, the prices um, 
the, the, the prices are really fair and very, very reasonable. If you go on our website and go to Ruby Panana, all of these pieces are all listed on that website with their um, descriptions, with their sizes, um, and with their prices. They are in descending order with the most expensive ones at the top and as you scroll down the, the less expensive ones at the bottom. Um, now, she talked about water jars. Mo a lot of these pieces are water jars. So a container that you would put water into, but please do not pot, put water into them now because they're really not waterproof. They might be water resistant a little bit, but they're not waterproof. And consequently, water can leach you the pot and it would eventually destroy it. Now we're not in the, we're not in the process of, we're not in the process of, um, We're not in the process of, of uh, I lost my train of thought, but, uh, but you know, we are trying to um, give you some sort of idea of what the, u the use of some of these pieces are. But what I guess what I was trying to say was that uh, what, because they shouldn't be used for water because eventually so the water will seep its way between the, the, the layers of slip in the paint and it could really damage your piece. And all, also, you know, they're really pieces of art and they're expensive and you can put water in a plastic pitcher that you buy at Walmart instead. Now, there's another container that would have water in it but only for a short time and, and only ceremonial. And that's the pieces that you see with the two spouts and the handle. These pieces are called wedding vases. And wedding vases are used in a marriage ceremony. And the whole idea is that two become one. And uh, in the wedding ceremony, the bride drinks from one side and the groom drinks from the other, sort of uniting their common cause. And wedding vases are usually made by a relative of the bride uh, and used in the ceremony. And then they can have it as a keepsake uh, from this, this, the ceremony they've uh, had together. But wedding vases are very popular uh, among our culture because they're so interesting to look at and they you know, have that real uh, cultural appeal to them. And also they make really wonderful wedding gifts because of the things that are used in traditional weddings, you know, like wedding cakes, well, they don't last very long. And garters and, and bouquets. I mean, most of those things have their own sort of life, but a good piece of pottery, um, like a wedding vase, can last forever. If you look at the pieces of pottery that they find in the ground from ancient cultures, thousands and thousands and thousands of years old, the pottery is still very much intact and that wedding vase becomes a permanent part of the, the couple's relationships. Uh, relationship. Um, the bigger pieces that you see uh, were used for storage. And while the Pueblo people, and by the way, Pueblo is merely a Spanish word that means village, the Pueblo people were sedentary. They were not nomadic. And consequently, they could make containers uh, to store the, um, the foodstuffs that they would need during the time of the year when it was not possible to grow things. 
hunters and gatherers tend to move on to follow the climate, to follow the flower bloom, to follow um, the various plant materials they would eat, and also to follow the herds who also follow the, the, uh, the food cycle. But when you are sedentary people, uh, you don't do that. And so they, they made, they constructed these large vessels that they could store um, grains in, or nuts, or dried fruits. Uh, that would supplement their diet during the winter when uh, there were no fresh things to eat, nothing but you know some a fresh thing that had four legs that ran didn't run fast enough, um, and so um, they could supplement their diet of meat uh, when um, when it was cold outside. Uh, my son and I recently we're talking about diets, you know, and there's the keto diet, and there, I mean, there's so many fad diets, it's unbelievable. But the one thing that we really sort of had a little chuckle over was one that's called the caveman diet. And we decided that the caveman diet was a diet of whatever the caveman could find to eat. So there were no specific foods or um, no specific ways of uh, measuring or accounting for the food that you eat because you just ate what was available. Uh, what Derek is doing is he is moving some of the pieces on our little turntable here so that you can get an idea of how Ruby's lovely designs travel around the pot and how they um, are really, you know, fascinating in terms of how the rainbows move and how the birds seem to move on, on the pieces. And we'll give you a, a whole idea of how you, you know, might place the pieces in your home because you can, you can get to see different parts depending on how you, how you display it or, you know, what your mood might be that day. Anyway, um, we, uh, we hope that uh, you will, uh, you have been enjoying what's going on. We are really happy to do this. We're thrilled to do this um, because this was our solution to see how we could supplement the income of the Native American potters. And, you know, some of the potters, most of the potters that we're going to uh, display have absolutely no other way of showing their pieces other than uh, either through us or through Indian Market. And now that Indian Market has been canceled, and we are effectively our, our storefront is effectively has been closed for months since the middle of March. Uh, we want to protect our employees and ourselves uh, from what's going on out there in the world. And we have been open, uh, of course, online because we have a, a very comprehensive website, but we've also um, invited people to make appointments and come and see us. And we have enough hand sanitizer and, and masks to outfit the Chinese army. Uh, and so we want to be just as safe as we possibly can here um, because we want to protect our employees. But also, uh, since we don't have as many customers, we certainly don't have the need to replace our inventory that often. But, so, but what we've been doing in, instead is replacing it up anyway. And uh, by the time this pandemic is over, the best selection in the entire planet of American Indian pottery is going to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's our pleasure to do that because uh, what we've gained from 
being part of another culture has really been wonderful. Um, another way of looking at life, another uh, sense of who we are and where we came from and where they came from. And also about, you know, the history of this country. And, and you know, I could go on and on and on and on about um, how much they contribute to us and what we contribute to them is minuscule by, by comparison. But right now, you know, everybody's hurting a lot and, and if they have no other source of income, which is true for so many of the artists that participate in, in Indian market, you figure that it's 15 to 1,700 artists, which translates into how many family members uh, that are involved that really depended on um, Indian market for their survival. Well, we're trying to do our little part to ease the burden for them. And um, like I said, if there, uh, Ruby is here uh, to have her own little Indian market. And um, the pieces of Ruby's are on our website. Um, if you go to um, andreafisherpottery.com and then click on artists and then click on Ruby Padana on the, on the P words, she will come up and take a look at all the pieces that she is offering here. Uh, we will, they start at the top of um, the, the screen and as you scroll down, they decrease in price. So the most expensive ones are at the top and the less expensive ones are at the bottom. We've been having a lot of trouble with Zoom and, and Google today. I apologize for all of that. Um, yesterday, everything worked just fine and dandy, but it seems like only one server is letting us come up. And, um, and Scott, our guru, our computer guru, is working furiously to try and figure out what all the problems are. And the fact that the East Coast is having so much bad weather that uh, perhaps that has something to do with it, and then maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, if you have questions for us, don't hesitate to, um, or especially for Ruby, don't hesitate to, uh, uh, you know, send us an email because we'll be happy uh, to a ask the questions on your behalf because Zoom is not, Zoom's not helping us out today, not at all. And so uh, we will be happy to ask those questions for you. And uh, it won't be long, I think, before Ruby will be back. And as soon as she comes back, she's going to start putting the designs on that um, pot that you, that gray pot that you see in the front, um, that eventually, well, after it's yeah. fired, will turn out to be one of these wonderful pieces that you see in front of you. Um, are we, we're just, we're just about ready. R Ruby's um, now full of turkey wraps and, and uh, coleslaw, and she is going to be coming back and uh, picking up this piece in front of us and uh, uh, painting on her Zia Roadrunner. Oh, she's going to shape. Oh, okay. Oh, well, uh, okay. What she's going to do, she took away that piece that she made earlier because now it's the time to do some shaping of it because it is at the stage where it's uh, optimum to move that clay around to get it in the final shape that she wants it, it to be. Well, you know, today we're going to finish up here right around 5 o'clock. That's a couple more hours to watch her paint. 
And then tomorrow we will have Thomas Tenorio from um, Santa Domingo, Kiwa Pueblo. Uh, they changed their name a few years ago back to what its original name was in their uh, their their language, and and in, instead removing the name that was given to their village, to their pueblo, by the conquistadors who came and name, renamed all the pueblo, mostly for Catholic saints that were, um, uh, that were important to uh, the Catholic Church in their particular area. And so, uh, um, Santa Domingo, Saint Dominic, was then changed back to Kiwa uh, a few years ago. Uh, several of the other pueblos have uh, have their original names and changed back to their original names, like San San Juan, Saint John, uh, which is uh, north of Santa Fe. Uh, they changed their name to Okeawinge which is the Tewa word for their, the naming of their original village. Anyway, are we set up to go back to Ruby? Okay, off to Ruby we go, and we're going to watch her shape that piece that she made this morning. Now that it is a little drier and, uh, and able to hold its shape a lot better. I'm going to shape this pot, stretch it out to the shape I want it. So I'm going to go in and start stretching it out. And I always start on the bottom stretching it out on on the bottom and then I'll work to the top. I don't know if you can see it, but it's starting to get bigger. And you'll see that I have like cracks in it, but I'll seal that back up as I go. Looking good, Ruby. Thank you. Ruby, while uh -huh. you're doing that, we just got an email from Gail in Hawaii. Uh huh. Uh huh. Mahalo. I'm watching Ruby decorate her beautiful pot. The demo is very enjoyable. I love getting to know a wonderful artist such as she. I find that getting her to speak about all of her traditional practices is very fascinating. We are getting a history lesson and a pottery demo all at once. <laughs> Mahalo and aloha, Gail. And I'd love to hear more about her family and their pottery traditions. Also, hear, hearing about life was like during her mother and grandmother's time. So, grandma and grand, and mom and grandma can take, you know, a little center stage and you can talk yeah. about, yeah, about what they, uh, what they've been doing, what they did and how they taught you and, and, and what their life was like and how it impacts yours. Yeah, um, well, my grandma, she used to um, um, make mostly big pieces. 
um, like the one behind me, you know, mostly for use in the Pueblo. And um, I remember um, when I was really young, she would um, coil, make coils, and she'd make them so long, she'd sling them over her shoulders and coil the pots. And um, anyway, and then my mom, she, it was, pottery was a way of um, supporting us. Um, we, well, there's two of us, two, there was two of us, my sister, my oldest sister, who's already passed, and, um, but my um, mom adopted um, four other kids, my cousins, my first cousins. So she had to support us, all of us. So this was her main source of income. And um, she, um, made quite a bit of pots and became famous and I know she used to when I was younger she used to get all these invitations from different art shows and everything but none of us knew what an art show was you know we didn't have no computers or phones or anything like that and so she never really took part in any art shows or anything like that, but she became well known. I should interrupt you and, and say that um, your mother's name was Seferina Bell, and the way she signed her pots, um, because um, she didn't write her name, instead she put a bell, bell. on the bottom that had a big round clapper. Yeah. And that, and and a very distinct way of of making zia pots, and uh, her pieces now are really very very prized by collectors because um, I mean they're so they were so well done, and her pieces are in countless museums uh, around the country and some in other parts of the world as well. What is that you're using on that pot, Ruby? It's my knife, my oh, kitchen, butter knife. Your my butter knife. knife. <laughs> your butter knife. See, that's all I'm doing is shaping it, stretching it. I'm pulling up as I go. Do the walls become thinner? Yes. And do you have to be careful that they don't get too thin in one place? Yeah. I like I said I've lost some when I've you know smoothing them out sanding them down I yeah, I would have made it too thin in a certain area and my hand would just go straight through it uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. How do you keep the top so level? A lot of times it's not really level. I, um, after it dries, I have, um, I glued a sanding paper on a piece of board and I use that to um, level off the top and the bottom. So this is all ready to let dry. And a lot of times when I do this, it will crack, start cracking, and it'll just cave back in. So I have to keep an eye on them when I'm in this process right here. Well, so. if it starts to crack, can you repair it? Yeah, if it's still wet, I'll just go ahead and put, add a little bit more clay mm -hmm. and um, repair it, smooth it back out. And... Um, Anyway, when I'm at home, 
and the strangest things I use, <laughs> besides my blow dryer. And the pizza pan. <laughs> and the pizza pan is, um, what do you call them? Ace bandages. Uh-huh. I'll take an ace, old ace bandage and I'll tie it around the, this area, the stomach part, I call it, and to give it support. Uh -huh. And um, anyway, so I used that one at home just to keep it from falling in. Does the ace bandage um, dry it out a little faster? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, no, uh, it just gives it support, just holds uh -huh. it up, especially the larger pieces. Uh -huh. The bigger you get, the more, you know, your the weight because this one's like sitting in the middle and this one's out. So it'll start cracking on the sides right here and it'll just cave back in. And once it does that, you start all over again? Yeah, yeah. you have to break it back down yeah. and say, oh well. <laughs> and as it dries, that pot's gonna get smaller and smaller as it shrinks. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. So this is all ready just to let it dry. So what are you going to do next? I'm going to um, probably start painting on my pot. Oh, good, good. That's my favorite part. I want to see you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I was going to say your helper was sleeping, but I, I guess know. Your, your helper. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> For all of you that don't understand the joke, Derek's dog is on a big, fluffy comforter, comforter right next to Ruby's table, sound, sound asleep. He was helping her earlier and watching what she was doing, but now he's sort of given up yeah. the ghost and is out cold. Okay. Let me see. Now, how did your mama teach you how to make pots? Oh, uh, she would just give us a clay, piece of clay, and tell us here. Just you make try it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and so you would you would learn by watching her. Uh huh. But she wasn't saying now make it a little taller or make it a little fatter. Or, no. No, you just learned she just, by. Just, she just you, told us here, just go for it. Go for it. And, and see what you come out with. Yeah. How how different that is from culture to culture that there was no you know sort of interference uh -huh. or continually continual criticism i know <laughs> as you would make something so you learn by trial and error yeah yeah did your grandma teach you uh, anything about pottery making kind of throw the coils over your shoulder no, you know, I, uh, we lost our grandma when we were really young. Um, she um, had leukemia. Um, so we lost her when I was probably about eight or something like that. So. And what, what was her name? Asunciona uh, Pino Galvan. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Yeah. That's your grandma? Galvan Pino. Yeah. I have one of her pots. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. 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 She, she was my grandma. Huh. Now, 
Now, what did you just put some water in I there? just put some water uh -huh. in. Is this I... a special bottled water, pottery water? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know that some of the potters only will use rainwater. Yeah. I've had this bottle, you can tell. Yeah, a long time. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just keep refilling it. Yeah, but some will only use rainwater because they said the groundwater is too hard. Uh -huh. The rainwater's nice and slippery and more acidic. Huh. So you're just getting it to the right consistency? Yeah, I'm just mixing it up. And that is the red clay from Jemez Puebla. This, no, this is the black paint that I'm mixing oh, right paint. now. Okay, I'm sorry, I yeah. can't see it. Um, yeah, this is the black paint. And you do the black outlines first? I do the black outlines uh, first around gotcha. the top and the bottom. And first thing I do, so I don't forget, is I etch my name on there. Well, that's one thing to look for with uh, um, American Indian pottery. So many people sign their name by etching their name right into the piece before it's fired. So it's fired in rather than fired on later. Or um, sometimes people will use uh, some kind of a marker after the pot has been made, but or paint their name on the bottom of it. But um, you know, it's rare that pieces are signed after, um, or a, as as a rule, signed after the piece is made. Every once in a while, you know, someone forgets, uh, but usually pieces are signed um, in the process rather than as an afterthought. Yeah, did, you, and, did you spell it right? Yeah, um, I spelled Oh good, because I'm, yeah, I'm a great one for signing a Jack and spelling my own name wrong. I know, I, that one time, I, I, I don't know what I was doing, but I kept putting um, N-A-N-A, -A -N -A, it was pa na 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 You sound like, you sound like a Paul Simon song. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Diamonds on the soles of her shoes. Yeah. Now, if someone talks to you while you're doing that, will you screw up on the lines? No. Oh, okay. No. no. Sometimes if somebody calls me on the phone, I'll be sitting there talking and uh, I just keep working. Uh, well, in order to create such a large body of work that uh, you've done, I would imagine you need every single minute of the day to do that. Yeah. Your assistant is sleeping. I know. Your, your assistant is, is lazy. Got tired from making the pot. <laughs> and helping me with lunch. Can can you see Stout in the picture, Derek? Barely. Barely. Oh. You would never know this, but we really like this dog around here. There's another one, but she's sleeping in the back room. Yeah. I know sometimes I've got a little chihuahua and sometimes when I'm working, because when I'm working at home, I usually have a pillow on there so I'm not bent over, yeah. you know, just to bring the pot up. Anyway, um, my chihuahua will get up on the bed and she'll slowly slide over to my pillow and I'm over here trying to paint. 
<laughs> and I have to tell her, shoo, get out of here. <laughs> you know, she decides she wants to be part of it. What's your chihuahua's name? Charlie. Charlie. Yeah. Wow. My little fat chihuahua, I call her. <laughs> she, for a chihuahua, she, she weighs 14 pounds. Oh my goodness. She, we, she was really tiny when we fought, first got her. Not anymore. <laughs> and, then, and then she started getting really, you know, fat. And we didn't know what was wrong because we weren't overfeeding her. So um, one of my daughter's friends said he had a dog that was um, like that. And he took it to the vet and they found out it had a thyroid problem. So I took my dog to the vet. Sure enough, I had a thyroid problem. Oh. Now I have to give her medicine every single day. I thought maybe she's going over to the neighbors. No. And they were feeding her too. No, she's not even allowed outside the gate. Uh -oh. She'll sneak out once in a while, but She's not allowed outside the gate. Yeah, we live right there in the main street of Hamas. Mm -hmm. And we get a lot of traffic through there. And um, we're scared that she's going to get hit if she goes yeah. outside in the road. And so we make sure the gate is always closed. And everybody thinks that it's a freeway out there. You know, speed limit's posted at five miles an hour. They're going 25, 30 miles an hour through yeah. there. So. How many people live at Hamez, roughly? I think it's like 2,000 or more. 2, it's, it's a big yeah. village. Well. I, I should explain if you just sort of tuned in. Ruby uh, was born in Saint in Zia Pueblo, and she married a guy from Jemez, and she lives in Jemez with him. But she still uh, does pottery in the style and the, in the tradition of her mama and her grandma from Jemez. Uh, I mean, from, from excuse Zia. me, from Zia. And Hamez and Zia are fairly close to each other um, as the crow flies, not, not too bad. So it isn't unusual for people to intermarry and then move into uh, the, 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 their Pueblo of choice. Yeah, we're like 12 miles apart. But I'm sure that, you know, a thousand years ago, that was, you know, <laughs> a long worlds, ways. worlds away, worlds away. Actually, the uh, right there behind Hamas, on the west side of Hamas, there's some Zia ruins up on the mesa right there. That's hmm. where Zia Pueblo used to be at first, until the um, Pueblo revolt or whatever, uh -huh. and then they moved down. Yeah, so, there was a lot of shifting around. And yeah. I mean, if you if you take a look at um, um, Jemez and Pecos, how they interacted with each other, they were yeah. far apart. And then some of the pueblos, I mean, there were many pueblos in the Pewaukee Valley north of us, and they were just completely abandoned. And, yeah. And, you know, they consolidated with other... Uh, Pueblos and some of the Pueblos people went to Hopi seeking refuge. Yeah. And uh, if you um, look at any of the um, the pottery from um, Hopi, there'll be some that is uh, designated Hopi Tewa. And what that means is the Tewa Pueblo excuse me, the Tewa speaking Pueblo people went to Hopi um, 
to get away from the Spaniards. And luckily, the Spaniards didn't come after them. And if they did come after them, they, would be, they were going to be Hopi's first line of defense against the Spaniards. And the, um, the Hopi people um, said, you know, come and stay. And they all lived, they lived on Second Mesa. And still to this day, they are called Hopi Tewas. They still speak the, the, um, the la there's, there's some people who still speak the language and they still, and they're the people in Hopi that make pottery. And um, there wasn't a whole lot of pottery making by the Hopi people before the Tewa people showed up. Some, but you know, not as prevalent as what was here in, in the Rio Grande Valley. Yeah. Mainly because Hopi didn't have the material. They didn't have as much clay. They had some clay, but not like you find in the, in the Rio Grande Valley. And uh, the Hopis then, if they needed containers and stuff, they trade. Well, I guess those black lines set your boundaries. Yeah, About they're where, kind of like my where, borders. Yeah, where your design will fit in. Yeah. And that steady hand. There aren't many people in this world that can draw a straight line, of, you know, even if their life depended on it. Yeah, I used to use my finger, little, my little pinky, as a balance for my um, hand till I broke my pinky. Mm -hmm. I know we talked a little bit earlier about um, you remembering as a child uh, that you washed your clothes in, in the river, uh -huh. that your family washed their clothes in the river. What, tell us some more things about what life was like when you were young. Um, it was hard. I remember it was hard. We didn't have very much, you know. A lot of times we were wearing hand-me-down clothes. Um, we got shoes maybe once a year right before school, maybe for Zia Fiesta or something. And there, were, there was a school at, hey, at Zia, or did you have to go far away to go to no, school? No, there was a, a, a school there in Zia. Uh -huh. So during the um, grade school years, we went to school right in the Pueblo. And um, we got a dentist there maybe once a year. Ow. And um, so I guess a lot of us older people, our teeth aren't really that good. A lot of them have dentures or what have you, you know, because we didn't, you know, really know how to take care of our teeth back then and stuff like that. Same with medical, you know. And, um, uh, it was, but it was fun at the same time, you know, you know, even though if it was work, helping my grandpa with the sheep, because we got to go hiking and everything, go play in the river yeah. while the sheep were grazing. <laughs> now, how many sheep did grandpa have? He had 500 heads of sheep. 500? Yeah. Did you eat them? Yeah, that was <laughs> our main source of food, uh, meat. And did, uh, um, did he sell any of them or trade any of them? Um, yeah, we used to sell the wool. Uh -huh. The wool is what we used to sell. I'm, you know, it was hard, you know, like um, having to shear the sheep. 
I remember one time we were branding the sheep with um, uh, paint, because uh -huh. that's what we used to use to brand the sheep. And I was assigned to hold the paint by the gate so they could dip the um, brand in there and as the uh, sheep passed and then the big old ram came charging at me. <laughs> <laughs> there went the paint and I went out. The <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, at, at, you know, at times it was hard, but, uh -huh. you know, it was fun at the same time. Yeah. Now, yeah. Did, was the school there when your mom was, was young? Uh, no. No, uh -uh. no, it wasn't there. Um, I'm not sure when the school started. It was a BIA school. Uh-huh. And I'm not sure when that started. But um, I went to school there at the Pueblo till I was, because they only went up to the sixth grade, I think it was, and then we had to go outside the village um, to the public school to go to school. And- um, But that was a shock. Yeah. Um, and then the biggest shock was the, um, my mom decided she didn't want us going to public school. So she sent us to a Christian school in Bernalillo where the Santa Ana Casino is across uh -huh. the street. There used to be a Christian school there. And that's where I went to school. Any certain denomination? Um, no. Uh, Just Christian, not Catholic? Not Catholic. Not Catholic. No. Uh -huh. So that's where um, I think all of us went to school. My um, stepbrothers and mm -hmm. stuff, my stepbrother, my sisters, Eleanor, uh -huh. those guys, we all went to that school there in Bernalillo till it closed down or till I ran away. <laughs> you ran away, Ruby. You adventurous woman, you. Yeah. So when you ran away, where'd you go? Huh? Where did you go when you ran? Where did you run to? I ran, ran away into Albuquerque oh. to my sister's, my oldest sister's house. And because um, I had gotten into trouble there at the school. Uh oh. And. Um, Anyway, I didn't want them calling my mom, but they had to since I ran away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't think that one through, did you? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after that, I didn't want to go back to the Christian school, so I went to the uh, West Mesa High School in Albuquerque, and that's where I graduated high school from. Wow. Now, at home, did you know, with your your mom and when your grandma was alive, did you speak Carries? Uh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, I um, spoke Carries when I was younger, um, but since we were sent to like the Christian school, and then later on I went to um, Albuquerque to live with my oldest sister. Um, we mostly taught English, so kind of, I kind of forgot my carries mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, and, um, but I can still get by, yeah. you know. Is it, I, is it like I, swimming? Yeah. Yeah, you don't forget all yeah. of it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so anyway, I, I, I do all right, and, you know, there's, some words that I say wrong and people laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but I can still speak Zia, you yeah. know. Great. So now what you doing? I'm marking where I'm going to put my rainbows. I kind of like even it out. And this is my rainbow. My what? old cardboard. <laughs> 
It's just a thing that I use to kind of guideline. And you can tell I've had it for a long time because it's all taped up and everything. And my measuring stick. <laughs> oh no, no, is that part of the pizza pan or part of the yeah. butter knife? Yeah, I just use my fingers to kind of measure to mm. even it out. Seems like this is an important part. Do you put a rainbow on every pot? Not really. I use Kiva steps. I use um, just different, you know, traditional designs. I, I like to mix it up. Uh -huh. You know, I use some of them. I go back to the old, old designs and everything uh -huh. like this one. I've got the Kiva steps with the rainbow coming out of it. And then the drumstick right there in the middle. It's all traditional designs, just put a different way. in California uh -huh. has another question. He's the one who asked about um, when you are polishing leather. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, he wants to know how you fix a painting mistake. What if you drip or have a slip, you know, or a smudge? Oh, a uh, smudge. What do you do? Either I put a design there or <laughs> if it's not too big, then I have my little um, exacto knife here that I can like scrape off. But if it's really big, I'll put a design or something there to cover it up. Yeah. <laughs> the design of unintended, uh -huh. unintended consequences. Yep. I hope that answers your question, Daniel. It seems like. Uh, uh, Ruby will either take it off, the, the extra paint off, or she will just incorporate it into to something new. Have you ever done any triple rainbows? No. No? No. I might... Well, I, I guess you would call it a triple rainbow. I would do like a red rainbow and a yellow, but in the middle I'd put like a design uh -huh. rainbow, so it would probably be called a triple yeah. rainbow. Now, did your mom paint rainbows on her pots? Yes. Uh-huh. Did she have a, 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 a stuck together, taped together rainbow? Oh, uh, no. As well? <laughs> I think she was a lot better than me. What about your grandma? Did she, have, did she paint rainbows also? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, a lot of the old ones, the real old ones, they had the rainbows. And then some had the continuous rainbow, mm -hmm. which represents the continuation of life. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, it was a lot of rainbows and birds, um, deers, mm -hmm. and flowers and stuff like that that they used to paint on there. 
Well, cool. your grandma must have lived through the, the 1918 flu epidemic. I probably she did. Yeah, did, did it hit uh, Zio Pueblo? I really don't know. Yeah. I know that San Ildefonso Pueblo, which is not too far away if it, by the way the crow flies, they were hit very hard. Yeah. But I don't know if it's because they were in, uh, they're closer to city life. Yeah. Than, than Zia is. Yeah. What about now? What's going on in the Pueblo with uh, um, the pandemic now? I know Zia, they got hit pretty hard with the uh, pandemic there. We lost um, six people from oh. the Pueblo there wow. because of the pandemic. In fact, we lost two in our family in loss. Oh. Um, so it hit our family pretty hard. And um, I know they, they were one of the villages that got really hit hard. Mm. Um, I know when both Eleanor and my youngest sister, they had it. And um, they, I think they were over 200 people there in the Pueblo that had it. Of, out of a thousand people? Yeah. So a fifth of the people had confirmed cases. Yeah. So anyway, they got hit pretty hard. Wow. You Have know. you been tested? Huh? Have you been tested? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Three times already. Three times? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The, well, because of, clo because of family? Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. And then they, Amos is being real careful. Yeah. You know? Um, we've been pretty lucky there. Um, they've been keeping a close eye on all of us, yeah. you know, protecting us and everything. When Zia started getting hit pretty hard, they shut Hamas down real quick. I mean, they, we've only got one entrance, one exit into Hamas, and it's always uh, patrolled and everything, you know, there's guards there and everything like that. So they're strict with us in Hamas, you know, we can't um, go, you know. You can't come and go. Come and go uh -huh. as we please, you know. And um, I, it doesn't really bother me because I'm always, you know, even before the pandemic, I, I was always home working, you know, and everything. But I know a lot of people complain, oh, we can't go to town when we want to, you know, but it's a big deal. Or yeah. we're all locked up. I say, you're not locked up. You've got your whole big backyard back there to play in. Yeah. You know, all the mountains All the mountains. There. Yeah, you go know. for a hike. Uh-huh. Wow. Well, yeah. we're lucky that we have you here today. Thank you. Uh-huh. I don't know about you, but I'm having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I'm doing here is I'm just drawing a bird, kind of sketching a rough sketching a bird in, what kind of bird I want to do. Well, we've been pretty well sequestered here. Uh, we've been closed. We're still closed to the public, but we are open by appointment. And of course, you know, we do stuff online. And yeah. We send out email blasts every week in hopes that we can still stay in touch with people around the country. But uh, just letting the general public in it's been really, you know, it's been really sort of scary being in New Mexico because everybody else around us is up in flames as far as the pandemic is concerned. And we've got this little slow burn <laughs> yeah. that's going on. And, and, you know, when the, you, 
the streets in August are empty and you know only a few cars you'll see parking along the street here and usually in August it's you, can't you know find you're, no parking. You're, after you're beating off the maddening crowd but now when we see cars parked on the streets they have out of state license plates and you know here we are sitting right between Texas and Arizona yeah. And so it's really scary. But our governor has been just great. I mean, she really has the best interest of the people who live here in mind, which is wonderful. So you're painting on the red rainbow now. Yeah. You know, and you see so many people walking around on the streets without masks on. But uh, the governor said... Uh, if you don't wear a mask and we catch you, you get a big fat fine. And yep. if they catch you the second time, you get even a bigger, much bigger fine. And uh, uh, I don't know if they have made people leave, but I know that she has made the rule that if you come from out of state, you have to be quarantined for two weeks. And that's kind of hard. Now, is this the way you, when you're painting at home, this is the order in which you follow yeah. as far as your painting uh -huh. is concerned? First, the, the borders. Yeah. And then the rainbows. Now I'll outline the rainbows, and then I'll work on my birds, and then decide what else I'm going to put uh -huh. on there. So how many hours would you think it takes for you to to make a pot? Say a big one like that, the behind you. How long did that take me this morning? No, um, no, no the, I mean the, the, oh, the big one. one. Yeah, how many hours does it take? Uh, just to build it up, just a cylinder. Yeah. Um, it takes me about four hours. And then to, to and then to go back in and shape, shape it, it and everything, and then the amount of time that you spent on um, uh, smoothing it yeah. out, polishing it. Uh huh. So you probably have maybe about thirty to forty hours uh -huh. in one of the big pots. But that doesn't count the time to go and get the clay no. and to clean the clay no. and to make the paints, collecting all the materials for the, the paint that you make. Yeah. Yeah. Very labor intensive. And really hard. It, it is. It means hard work and you have to have some talent. <laughs> Yeah, that, that one time I went um, some right there by Hamas, the side of Hamas, the hill. Um, it's right off the highway. Anyway, they have some of that white that I use for my white slip. Uh -huh. Anyway, I went up to get some. And um, anyway, it was when the snakes were already out. <laughs> the, the creatures you like best. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, I had a small bucket, you know, and I had my little short um, shovel. So I climbed up on the hill and the rain had washed, you know, like arroyos on the side of that where the uh, paint was. And I got up to the top of that place and I'm standing right there on the top of the little hill, um, maybe about maybe 15 feet off the um, bottom. And all of a sudden this snake comes out from, the, from no place. I'm standing there with my little bucket and my little, little shovel. shovel. <laughs> <laughs> no place to go. I couldn't jump off. Did they hear you at, at Amos Pueblo huh? yelling 
Do they yeah. hear you at Hannah's yelling? Oh, yeah. Uh, probably yeah. everybody heard me scream. Yeah. After all, it's only 16 miles away. Uh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're doing. And, that, and it dried that quickly. Uh-huh. Because the, the clay body, the pot's so yeah. porous that it just soaks it right up. Now, before you were telling us, you lick your fingers. Because yeah, because I don't have fingerprints. And it's hard to hold on to those polishing stones that are smooth without having damp fingers. Also, you know, the last time you robbed the bank, you had your fingerprints uh, uh, burned off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you said earlier you didn't have fingerprints because the clay is uh, rough, rough and in the and, sanding and uh -huh. everything. And, it, you and know. they've just worn away. Yeah. You could have lots of fun if you were ever fingerprinted or needed to be fingerprinted. I know, really. <laughs> yeah, you, you could paint little birds on each finger so that when they rolled the ink on it, uh, that uh, they would, you know, get little birds instead of lines. Uh -huh. What hummingbird? Yeah, a little hummingbird. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, I have 13 hummingbird feeders hanging in my backyard, and, this, and they each hold a quart. And this morning, I had filled most of them yesterday, and uh -huh. this morning there were 11 of those feeders. That's almost three gallons that they ate in one day. I know. They really aren't birds. They're just little pigs with wings. <laughs> yeah. I had this, I don't know if it was a hummingbird, but it looked like a hummingbird. I mean, it had a long beak like a hummingbird, uh -huh. but it was a big one. Yeah. It was like probably about that big. Huh. And it came around to my house, to my feeders for about two years. And finally it disappeared. Aww. I don't know if it was a hummingbird of a different species or whatever maybe it got a job in hollywood like andre the giant or yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. or the, the incredible hulk yeah. of hummingbirds so you polish what you've painted as you go yeah And the, the polishing um, is just uh, an artistic expression. I mean, in the, you know, 300 years ago when Zia people made Zia pots, did they polish them, stone polish them then too? Uh, yeah, I think they did. Yeah. And um, I think they're, um, what to call it, their red paint back in the day. I remember my mom for, I know she used to use the red back here on the uh -huh. bottom, the red, same red clay that I use, the paint. But for her rainbows, she used to use this, um, it was a yellow um, uh, clay that we had to go dig up for her. And um, anyway, um, that, that was her red. And when she fired it, you know, when she painted it on, it was yellow. But when she fired it, it would turn red. Huh. And, um, so, you know, it's we kind of, I know I went to go look for that yellow paint, the yellow clay. Uh -huh. But um, through all the years, the rains and everything yeah. has completely wiped uh, it out. So that clay bed's gone. Huh? Yeah, so it's not 
there anymore. Mm -mm. The supply isn't there anymore. And, um, but, um, you know, the red uh, works just fine. I know that yellow, yellow paint was easier because you, you could let it dry and not worry about it not getting a shine, you know. Do the birds go on next? Yes. Oh, good. Mr. Al, are you back there? Maybe Al would like to talk to Ruby for a couple minutes while I have a little break. We'll sell Nala to talk to you for a couple minutes, okay. if that's okay. Okay. If you'll come. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Albert, ah. <laughs> the microphone doesn't want to come off, does it? Here, let me try it, Derek. Yeah, all right. Here we go. and she's painting the rainbows first and then she'll be painting birds. Maybe I should sing no over, singing allowed. over the sorry. rainbow, no, my not, Judy Garland. No, you're not allowed to sing over the rainbow. Everyone is watching, this is Al Miller. He's one of our salespeople and he's just, you know, really great. We're gonna bring the camera on you. That's not the camera, you're watching. The camera's over here. Okay. Well, Ruby, what an honor it is to have you here in the gallery. Uh -huh. And I must tell you a story. Um, a month ago, one of our customers called and wanted to get a pot for his wife's birthday. And he kind of had something in mind. I said, no, this is the one I think your wife is going to absolutely love. So I picked out a Ruby piece. Just this morning, I was talking to her, and she is so thrilled to have a piece of yours. And she's watching us right now. So... Oh, Let's really? say happy birthday, Joan. Okay. Happy, happy birthday, birthday Joan. Joan. And we hope you're watching this. Anyway, she's one happy woman. And we're so happy that you're here. And I'm watching you in the back, and it's amazing your city, uh -huh. how city your hand is and everything like that. I'd be a nervous wreck. Yeah. So... Anyway, you're starting your magical rainbows? Yeah, my rainbows. We sure could use the rainbows today, couldn't we? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, really. You guys haven't gotten very much rain up Not yet? at all. I think two oh, or three little wow. storms. Now, when I was watching in the back room, I noticed the knife that you used to guide the sides of the edges. Uh -huh. How long has that been with you? Oh, gosh. I think I, since I started making pottery. Really? Yeah. It, it used, looks like it's been worn down over years. It, it used to be straight edge. It did. Uh-huh. And it's gotten worn down. <laughs> uh-huh. So it's really become a, tool, uh, a real keepsake tool. Yeah. And how long have you had your polishing stones? Oh, gosh. Since I started uh, these two 
this one's my mom's oh, wow. uh, stone, and this will belong to my um, husband's grandma. Uh -huh. And um, I found that outside um, in an old toolbox, wooden toolbox. And, um, but this one I found in the river. Oh, wow. I was um, walking along the side of the river and I saw it and I said, oh, I think that would make a good polishing stone. So I started, I used it, I started using it and I, the more I used it, the more shinier it got. The better it got, I'm better sure, do you feel? Gotten. So the stones do get passed down from generation yes. to generation. Uh -huh. My partner was in a um, home in St. Ildefonso and the potter was there working on her pots and he said, kind of said, I sure would like your stone. And if she could have killed him with her eyes, it was just like, <laughs> get out of here, you know? Yeah. Well, one day we had a um, potter come in and they went to the stone store next door, the little mineral shop, uh -huh. and they found a beautiful polishing stone that they used. Now, how many coats of slip do you put on top of the pot? I was watching. It looked like like three, four. On um, the rainbow? No, the, um, the white. The slip mm -hmm. itself, I put four. Really? Yeah. Wow. Four layers of slip. And how long do you let your clay dissolve to create your slip? Um, it depends on the clay and how big it is. Uh -huh. um, you know, the smaller ones dissolve quicker. The other ones, I have to soak them overnight if uh -huh. they're big. And then, you, do you have a special place you get, gather your slip? Uh, yeah. And is it all the potters from Zia kind of gather from the same area? Yeah, we so do. The, now we, this this year, I have to say, I'm loving the chocolate brown uh -huh. on several of your new pieces. Oh yeah, that is just it's so rich and gorgeous. Now, uh -huh. is that a hard mineral to find? Actually, that one is. I mixed it myself. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, I'm a chemist too. Okay. Um, um, that one. And I'm giving all my secrets No, away. no, you don't have to give the secrets. But So you mix that combination of several different yeah, minerals. Yeah, that one is actually this red mixed with my black. I love it. Yeah. I, I love it because it gives your um, pottery a, a new color. And yeah. Yeah, I, and I've been using it for quite a while, but only in small spots. Oh, no. I There's not, a neck not, over here I yeah. absolutely love what you're doing. Yeah, I'm using it more in bigger areas now, you know. And then I noticed on a piece that we put away for one of our customers, you have a beautiful roadrunner or bird, uh -huh. and it's in a crescent shape. It's not a full circle like normally, or it's not in a case in a rainbow. Uh -huh. The crescent, can you explain that shape to me? Because I am going to be talking to the gentleman tomorrow about that. Um, it was the $950 piece. It had a beautiful bird in the middle, and it had a broken circle. Uh, like that yeah. one on the, that flute? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's just a traditional, a variation? what you call it, drawing of the road runner. Okay. But just um, done with different designs in the stomach just mm -hmm. to make it a little bit different. It's really rich. I love that yeah. the design element is, you've got it smoking there, girl. I love it. Yeah, I like to change up a little bit and once in a while just do something different, you know. Uh huh. Now, what are you using? Are you using a chamois there? No, it's just um, actually a soft look at cloth. how thin it is. A t-shirt like. This was actually my daughter's um, old jogging pants. Okay. And it was like really soft and through the years it, that I've used them, uh -huh. I've got, you know, several pieces and it's gotten thinner and thinner. <laughs> now I'm going to ask a question, does that have to be laundered at all? or? Can, uh, yeah. Uh, periodically. I, I, yeah. I okay. do wash them. Yeah. I was wondering about that. Yeah. In the back room when I was watching, I, I thought, oh, that looks like a leather deerskin chamois. No. Uh -uh. In fact, I tried a chamois and it didn't 
work very well for me. I think it was still too rough uh -uh. on my um, paints and they kind of scratched it or something. See, I, I, well, we have one potter in the gallery. He uses a white athletic sock. And I always kind of thought that'd be kind of, I thought that'd be a little bit hard on him because there's a lot of texture to a white uh -huh. sock. But it seems to work for him, but this thing really yeah. does its thing. Yeah, this is just a old, my daughter's old jogging pants oh my <laughs> that <God>. I tore apart. <laughs> now, is it is there a pot of the part part of the pottery that you prefer doing? Did you like? I noticed the putting the pot together went very smooth. Uh huh. Is it hard? Do you have one um, part of the project you like better, like painting or building? I like build, building. Building. Yeah, them. You, it just I goes like, so easy for yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I like to. That knife just blew me away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been with me for a lot of years. Isn't that incredible? Look at how much oh my gosh. it's worn down. It used to be straight. And it does what you want it to do, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you finished that pot, did you know exactly what the design was going to be, or does, does it just start flowing out of you when you start putting uh, the brush to the pot? I just start, you know, as I go, I decide, well, maybe I'll paint this or okay. whatever, you know. Uh -huh. I don't really have any plans ahead of time how I'm going to paint it or anything. And then when you're out like at Indian Market or something and you, you go by a fellow person's booth from your Pueblo and you see something a little bit different, can you ever take that and incorporate a small portion of it into something you're working with or are these all traditional ruby designs? No, they're, I think all of us um, Zia potters here, you know, because it's all traditional Zia designs and we all share them. Uh -huh. We all you know, have our different ways of putting them. And so like me, you know, putting like the... Um, Half medallions? Yeah, there, the those. drumsticks in the middle like that, you know, grouping them together. You know, that's me. You know, that's my way of making myself different and my designs is still traditional, but I just put them a different way. And when I'm working with customers and we're talking about ruby pieces, one thing I always bring out is ruby can do a pot the size of a postage stamp, and she can do one as big as a 10-gallon drum, yeah. which is really good because so many potters do the same size over and over again, but you're so versatile, so your uh -huh. comfort level is really interesting as far as what you can do for size. Yeah. Okay, has the um, lack of Indian market, I mean, that must just have destroyed you this year. Oh, it did. It, in fact, all my shows have gotten canceled this year. Oh. All my um, shows that I do during the summer here in the state. And, of course, you know, no traveling out of state anymore for a while. You know, so... so so how many shows does, it, does an artist like you participate in? I do, what is it? Um, Memorial Weekend, is it Memorial? Yeah, Memorial Weekend. I usually do the um, show in Hamas or the Native Treasure Show and then Market. And then I just recently started doing um, Placitas. Um, and now that, um, it'll probably pick up next year again. And, um, and then I, you know, do s like small shows. Mm -hmm. And like I say, I don't, a lot of them, I don't just take pottery. Uh, a lot of the small shows, cause like, um, I do a show at the Presbyterian Christmas Hospital. markets too. You do, don't you? I think I've seen you at a Christmas market yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. I, I think those look like a lot of fun. They look like it's um, bringing the family and the friends back to the village together, whether it's your village or some other uh -huh. village. Because you do you do um, tie in with the same people at the same shows. I always love. Yeah. It. 
Yeah. Did you ever do eight northern? I used to. Was that the best or yeah, what? Yeah, I know. I missed that show. I love that show. Especially that was the most exciting. When, that was more exciting than Indian Market. Yeah, especially when we were traveling, traveling around from Pueblo to, to Pueblo. the Pueblos, you know, different Pueblos, not just being located in one spot. I loved it. You got to see a little bit of everything that way. I'm not going to talk to you when you're doing that fine line there, girl. No, I'm fine. Are you? Yeah. Like I told Andrea, sometimes my friends will call me when I'm painting or whatever, and I'll just put it on speakerphone, and I'll be sitting there yakking away. Now, do you have children? You I've have a got daughter. one daughter. Now, does she do any pottery? She knows how. She um, she was doing it when she was in um, high school for a while. And um, in fact, she got a best of show at Eight Northern for one of her pieces. Isn't that wonderful? I think the first piece that she ever did, she got this for show. And I've still got it at home. Good. <laughs> Until I, I paid her for it. Uh-huh. You know, I said, you're not selling that. I'm keeping that. Now, with you, you've been doing this for so many years. You must have a lot of regulars that it's so much fun to touch base with when they come to the shows to your table. Yeah. Yeah. Like old friends. Old friends. You know, doing a show, it's not just, you know, the financial part of it, but it's also seeing your fellow artists, your customers, which have become friends, you know. So, you know, I miss all that, you oh. know, seeing all my friends and everything like that. And um, some of them, I... Um, you know, customers that I've known for a long time that have become friends, I've, I have their numbers, and so I, I'll call them or text them, see how they're doing and everything like that. So it's one, it's becomes family, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I it's love it. It's like being part of family, you know. Now, when you gather your clay, how, do you do you gather a lot of it at once, like a couple buckets of it, and work from that? <laughs> More than a couple of yeah. buckets. You go for a, a lot, right? Yeah, I, I that during the spring, like I said, is when I gather all my materials before the snakes come out, my favorite <laughs> things, you know, and. Um, I gather enough to last me the whole year because during the winter you can't really, no. you know, dig into the ground. It's too hard. And um, so spring when everything's thawing out before the snakes come out. Now when you when gather your clay, do you have to carry it quite a distance? One of our potters here, he has to carry it like two miles from the clay vein to the his truck. Uh -huh. Is there a lot of lugging it for you, or are you lucky? No, <laughs> mine is uphill to downhill. Oh, actually, I have to climb up to the clay pit and then carry heavy five-gallon buckets of clay down. That's why my arms are so long; they keep stretching every year. <laughs> <laughs> you need one of those wagons. Yeah. I wish we could you have a wagon or dolly or something to take up there, but there it's rocky and everything. And then when so, you when you get home, do you start processing the whole batch of it right away, or do you do it in sections? No, just sections. I just put them like my clay that I use for my pottery. I put them in barrels, and um, you know I'll go like for three four days getting clay just the clay itself and that's a and lot that, of work isn't and it and that's a lot of work and so i'll just put it i'll lay it out 
and let it get dry. And then after it gets completely dry, then I'll put it in the barrel, a big 55 gallon, you know, um, uh, barrel. And that's my supply for the whole year or maybe more. Mm -hmm. And same with my paints, um, you know, like the gray paints, the background slip, I'll get maybe, probably maybe about, mm, I would say, what size is that? Probably a three gallon can. Yeah. And that that's gonna last me for a while. And, it's, and you have to grind everything down and make it purify it and everything? Yeah, uh-huh. Now when um, I worked with clay, it was we always liked to use clay that was a little bit, um, it really s kind of smelled to it because it was breaking down with a little bit of bacteria. Uh-huh. Does your clay get that way where, you know, kind of gets a little bit of funky and black um, it comes it becomes very smooth then uh yeah if you um have it like in a bucket mm -hmm. when it's wet it'll get like that yeah. it'll get like um oh gosh kind of rotten or yeah yeah yeah, like yeah. That. but that's what the that's aging it and that's supposed yeah. to be really good to work with yeah yeah so Anyway, but I don't let mine get get like that. No, it, it's it just smells too bad. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah, usually I um, when I'm like processing my clay, I'll do it in five gallon buckets, like as far as grinding it down, breaking it down and grinding it down and um, uh, straining it and everything and mixing it. it it's in five gallons mm -hmm. that I mix and then I'll, you know, leave it in the plastic bag and, oh, yeah. you know, let it um, just use it as I need to. Well, I've been a big fan of your pieces for years. I just love the um, design work you put on them. The colors and your shapes are so spectacular, so traditional. Uh -huh. and I noticed I was watching you were um, showing how to put a pot on your head. Yeah. Oh my God, I saw the, um, <laughs> the dancers with the pots yeah. on their head. Uh -huh. Windy, windy day up at um, the museum on Museum Hill and not a one of them fell off or broke, but they all licked their hand, then their hair, and then they put a little on the pot and it, just yeah. a little bit of saliva seems to make them stick. Yeah. Yeah, I know that's the way they used to carry the water from the river uh -huh. before we had running water there in Zia. Is there a lot of water? Do you have a good water source there? A river? Oh, Zia. The water, the river, it's not very good no. because... By the time it gets down to Zia, Hamas and Hamas Springs and all those little communities um, draw, off of you draw off of it for their, what you call it, fields right. and stuff like that. Now with the virus going on, have you been doing pottery at a regular basis? Even yeah. though the markets have kind of dried up a bit? Yeah. yeah. I, like I told Andrea, I've been... Um, what to call it. I've been staying busy with my pottery. I didn't slack off, you know. I said, you know, it's, I'll just pack it away. It's not going to spoil. Right. It's going right. to be there. When next year or whenever this virus passes or we get a vaccine where it's, we're safe to do art shows again, then I'll have pieces then ready. And you'll I be ready to go. To work so hard, Good you know. For you. You make it look so easy. Yeah, usually my black paint, I when I I don't use it for a few days, if I'm not constantly stirring it, I have a hard time it 
it has a hard time settling down uh -huh. and I have to keep going over and over in it till it, you know, and then after a couple of days it'll like settle down and it'll start working and I work faster oh, good. in painting. It goes on a little bit easier then. Yeah. And who was your um, mentor? Who helped you get started? My mom. Okay. And what what was her first name? Like? Seferina. Yeah. Yeah. Bell, wasn't it? Bell. It's always exciting when a piece of hers comes in on the secondary market. Uh huh. I love it. Now, was she pretty proficient? Did she do a lot of pottery? Uh, she did quite a bit, you know, uh, she didn't do no art shows like me. No, no, no. You know, like, um, we didn't, back then, we didn't, none of us knew what an art show was. You know, she, she was used to get invited to, um, the Santa Fe in the market when it first started. But we didn't know, you know, what it was or anything like that, so we never, brought her and then we didn't know how to drive either back then when um, she was doing pottery and um, so she was mostly selling out of her home uh -huh. you know our house or um, if my brother or my oldest sister came home they take her to go wholesaling to the stores mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Now, you said brother, does, was he a potter ever? No, no. And you're, don't you have a, do you have a sister? I've got um, one older sister who passed away. Oh. Um, she's my real sister, my mm -hmm. blood sister. Right. But I've got um, three, three sisters, yeah. Eleanor, Rachel, and Reyes, stepsisters, uh -huh. and then my stepbrother okay. that my mom adopted. Oh, how wonderful. They're, they were my, um, they're my first cousins, and um, their mom um, left them um, with my grandpa to raise, uh -huh. and she left and got married, and my, my mom ended up adopting oh. them. She raised them, and so we're, you know, brothers and sisters. You know, are you, do any of them pot, or did they pot at all? Um, Eleanor um, still does a little bit. Right now, she's not doing very much of it. She's, she's been, um, what to call it, busy um, in Zia with the um, school. There. She's yes. been teaching a language class and also a pottery class to the younger kids. See, so, that's wonderful. Yeah, so she hasn't really been active, you know, in doing art shows, not like she was before she got that job. But I keep telling her, you need to quit, stop working, retire, you know. Yeah, but that's easier said than done. It's yeah. in her system, don't you think? Yeah, she says, I don't know what I would do with myself. I say, go back to your pottery, you know, do, do things, you know. Now, did the pottery come easy to her like it did to you? Uh, yeah, not really. I had to kind of, and she was more involved in helping my mom. Okay. Like painting the pottery and stuff like that when we were growing up and so she knew how to paint pottery but um, when she decided to start doing pottery again um, when we after I had started doing pottery I kind of pushed her into doing starting the pottery again so anyway so I had to um, kind of reteach her a little yeah. bit. You freshen know, her up a little. Freshen her up a little bit. 
Now, if we put, gave a piece of your mother's pottery in your hands, it becomes totally different to you, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you feel a lot more than we feel, right? Uh -huh. I mean, you feel the spirit and everything. It's always interesting when a person comes in and there's a piece of their mother's or father's pottery, an older piece in the gallery. It's always so neat to put it in their hands because they travel. Yeah. Emotionally, I think. I actually found um, one of my very first pieces uh, um, that I made um, there in, um, what you call it, um, San Ysidro. No. I guess the, um, I had sold it to somebody and the guy that I got it back from, anyway, um, uh, he used to have a bar. So people would, you know, steal from their families and go pawn them or sell them and everything. And um, after he closed his bar down, and his wife passed away. And um, anyway, he had, you know, all this pottery, Indian baskets, and, you know, a lot of Indian stuff. He asked me, because um, he wanted to do a, a sale, you know, and he asked me to come help him, because I used to bartend for him. I uh -huh. used to work for him. And he asked me if I could come help me, help him, um, like, price some of the pottery and stuff like that and lo and behold he yeah, had one of my very first pieces i bet it had to be exciting huh? yeah <laughs> how did yeah. it feel in your hands oh it was like did you feel I, youth yeah i you know at first i didn't um i didn't recognize it uh-huh and um i said who's i know it's a zia pot but whose pot is it? He says, Ruby, turn it over. And I turned it over. It was mine. I love those stories. <laughs> it's been a great journey for you, hasn't it? Yeah. You can see it in your eyes. Yeah. They, they yeah, come I alive. Love, I love doing pottery. You know, it's, it's my life. A lot life. of work. Huh? Lots of work. Yeah. It's a lot of hard work, but I enjoy doing it. Isn't it exciting when you're at market and somebody comes to your booth and they become so alive uh -huh. and they have to be touching your things and yeah. you see the energy from the pot to them and it's just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. A successful adoption has taken place. Yep. There was, um, during the years when, um, what you call it, um, Eight Northern was right. going on. That one year I was um, there at Eight Northern. And um, anyway, there was this family that walked up to my booth. They had a little girl, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years old. And um, anyway, she was asking me questions and I didn't realize that she was blind. And um, anyway, I was telling her and then her, you know, like different things about my pottery and her mom told me she was blind. I said, oh, okay. And uh, I told her, you want to see my pottery? You know, actually, you know, kind of like see it through mm -hmm. me. I told her and I said, I took her hands and I started showing her the different designs. Because the black paint is rough and you can feel oh, like can the feel design, it. you know, and, and she was so happy. She felt the shape of the bird and everything like that. She was so happy. She said, Mom, I need one of these pots. <laughs> so they ended up buying a small pot oh, for yeah. her, you know, and you could see the happiness, you know, in her face and everything knowing how like, I explained it and everything like that. But that was my favorite. See, even though when you're looking at, like I'm looking at that large pot over there, it looks smooth. Uh -huh. But if I close my eyes yeah. and feel it, yeah. there's so much texture and there's a story with it. Uh -huh. 
Well, I'm just so honored that you're here. It's such a thrill. And I love your work. <laughs> Does she want her chair back? <laughs> Now, some, is there a, that's, I know you're working on a rainbow, uh -huh. right? Now, is there sometimes, is there a rainbow that kind of continues? It's like a, is it, is that called a rolling rainbow? It's right. the continuous rainbow that goes all the way that's around. That's the rolling rainbow, right? Uh, yeah, or the continuous, continuous. rainbow. Now, do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I, um, what you call it, that represents the continuation of life. Yeah, you know it's beautiful. So I I do that. Yeah, I think in fact I did one on one of the pots over there. And now, will you give it a polish with that cloth again when you get all done painting? What's that? Will you, like, will you take that thin piece of fabric and buff it all in a little bit when you're done? Oh, uh, no. No, just uh -uh. the paint stays? Yeah. Okay. Now, I notice you, you have an exacto blade. What's going on? Uh, if I make a mistake, <laughs> It's Daniel? called a touch-up tool. <laughs> yeah, I just clean it up a little bit. hard to draw a straight line without oh. your glasses on. I'm telling you, do I know that? You know. The eyes and hands don't work like they used to do. Yeah. Yeah, I um, usually wear my reading glasses when I'm painting. Right. So it's kind of like, am I doing it right? <laughs> now, I notice you have longish fingernails. Now, does that ever get in the way? No. Okay, so you know what you're... Yeah, it, okay. I've gotten used to working with them, and I cut them, but they grow back so fast, and they are hard as... Hard, as... hard, hard. Okay, you're lucky. So, you know, it doesn't bother me. I just have gotten used to working with long nails. Well, the only time it bothers me is when I'm making a wedding vase, because you're twisting oh. and turning. Now so, those are really the most difficult thing to yeah. make, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. They're beautiful though. Yeah, they're the hardest for me to make. <laughs> a wedding vase will take me about, just a small one will take me about four hours just to build to it put up. Together, put it together. Yeah. That's good to know because I didn't know that. Yeah. I know it's the hardest piece to do. Yeah. Yeah, and then my hands are so big, that, you know, just doing the neck, it's very hard because my hands are so big. Well, how do you do the work on the neck? I mean, uh, it's just, really hard, isn't it? Yeah. Now, you clean that up when it's all attached, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then that handle. Uh-huh. That really has to dry carefully, doesn't it? Yeah. Because of the shrinkage. Yeah. Beautiful. I'm hoping we get to see a bird show up on that pot. Yeah, here in a minute. Now, does your village have any 
markets during the year normal on a normal good year? Do they do a market out there? Uh, no, not really. They have like a small Christmas bazaar. Right, They're, I love those. Those are yeah, my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, they have a, have that one, and I know one year they had a art show during Father's Day weekend. Oh, wow. And that went really well. I don't know why they didn't continue, with, continue it or whatever, but it was held right there by the um, governor's office right up close to the highway. And they had dances, they had the eagle dances, and they had, I can't remember what other kind of dances they had, but it, it was a good turnout. And it was well attended. Yeah. Now there's nothing scheduled. Your, your Pueblo is probably closed down. We're all closed down. Good. I think all the villages are closed good. down. Yeah, the ones up by our home are all closed down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nobody's allowed into the village unless you have, like, if it's the phone company or right. something like that. That's the only ones that are allowed into the villages. Now the black that you're using for outlining, is that a mineral? Uh, or, yeah, it's like a raw clay. This is the raw, raw black that I have oh, wow. right there. So when you came up with the beautiful chocolate brown that I've been talking about, was that kind of an experiment? That was, yeah. That was kind of like I wanted a different color and I kept, you know, make, you know, messing around with my paints and yeah. stuff like that. And I came up with that like deep dark it's so chocolate beautiful. brown. You know, when I'm like going out for a walk or anything like that, I'll look around for different clays and stuff like that, and I'll I'll test them out on like broken shards that I have at home. Mm -hmm. How they're, you know, they'll polish up or how they're fire and stuff like that. So I'm always looking around. For different clays. And now, stuff. when you fire, how many pieces do you fire at a time? Are you one or do you do multiple? Well, I do, depending on the size. Like the little one ones. I, those I can do maybe 10 pieces at mm -hmm. one time. And then the large, the large one is one, one is by, right? by itself. I bet you're just, everything has to be just perfect for a uh -huh. large piece, doesn't it? Yeah. The way you hold it, it's like holding an old friend, isn't it? Uh-huh. The shape just fits right in your hand. Are there a lot of children 
that are starting to, you said your sister teaches pottery to little kids. How yeah. does that look? Ah, uh, they're, they're not really taking to it. Uh, I think it's just too much hard work for these young kids these days, you know. And they rather go sit behind a computer. Uh, or doesn't that make you crazy? Like, I know, yeah. So, but, you know, they we're trying, trying to teach people how to do it. It must be exciting when she finds one that gets it. Uh-huh. And people are t always tell me, you know, I wish I knew how to make pottery, you know. I tell them, well, come over, I'll teach you how. You know, I'm not stingy with teaching people how to do it. Just like that um, young man, um, what's his name? Ulysses Reed. Um, I guess he had asked around Zia, you know, several of the potters, if they could teach him how to do pottery. And nobody didn't want to teach him how to do pottery. And he came to me, I guess I was the last person he was. You should, you should have been the first you know? one, <laughs> knocking and, on your door. Yeah, and he came to me, I said, sure, I'll teach you how, you know. And, and did he take to it? Yeah. Great. Yeah. He did. So what's his name? Ulysses Reed. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how much he does it. I know he's into a lot of um, different um, um, types of, um, well, different things, you know, like... Um, what do you call it? Arrowhead making the flint? Oh, flint, flint working with flint? Yeah, and then he That's does... That's hard work. Yeah, and then he does, um, what you call it? Um, Mesa Verde style oh. pottery. Okay. Um, That's kind of like gray, grayish color or yeah. whatever. He does that and... I think the last I heard, he was working at the um, garden center in Santa Ana. Oh, really? Yeah, so I don't know, you know. I hope he's still doing the pot. Yeah, I think he is a little bit. It's just, you know, um, I told him it was kind of a hard time to begin, you know, pottery. Because, uh -huh. you know, after 9-11, things kind of slowed down for pottery sales and stuff like that. But I said, you can still do a good living. Oh, yeah. But he's got, I think, maybe three, four kids. And, you know, to support kids on a, just a pottery income, it's kind of hard. It's Oh, it's horrible. You know. That's why I didn't have a lot of kids. <laughs> no, pottery actually put her through the uh, last two years of her high school because I she was kind of getting um, wild on me when she was in high <laughs> I school. I think we better be careful. I think she texted you already. <laughs> Yeah, she she was kind of getting wild on me, so I took her out of the public school and put her in a private school in Albuquerque. Uh -huh. And um, so I had to pay for that, two years of that. And then um, she went to Colorado College, um, got her um, degree in um, anthropology, for forensic anthropology. Oh, how interesting. And... Um, Paying four years of that, and then, and then she decided to go back to nursing school here at some Santa Fe Community College. Okay. So I ended up, you know, 
Helping her with that. Helping with that. So. So is she a nurse now? She's a nurse. She's a registered nurse. And where does she, where does she work? In Albuquerque at the Presbyterian Hospital. Oh, how wonderful. Yeah, so. Was she glad that her mother put her into a different school? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not at the time, I bet. Yeah, yeah, she, you know, she's, I guess now she says mom knew best. Well, Ruby, this has been a real honor for me, uh -huh. and um, I think I should come over there and we should wave to everybody. I know, huh? I don't know how to get unhooked. Is there any nap time? Here's Andrea. I thought he was. Okay, Ruby and I are going to sign off now, and uh, no. nothing but the best to you, Ruby, and this was an honor, and I do love your pottery, and take care of yourself. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that was a big hug from Al. Uh-huh. But thanks, Al. Thanks for taking my place. Uh, wow. How are we doing? Let me see your bird. Oh, boy. Got the beginning comes. of the bird. A roadrunner, huh? Uh huh. That New Mexico Roadrunner. Did you ever watch the old Roadrunner cartoons with yeah. Coyote? You know, uh -huh. coyotes are really sly, clever creatures. Very clever. And, and somehow that Roadrunner outfoxed him out every foxed chance him. he got. Yep. Now, are there a lot of Roadrunners around? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. A lot of them. That's, I've only seen a Roadrunner in New Mexico, one other place other than around Zia Pueblo, and that was in the airport parking lot in Albuquerque. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just trotting through the parking lot. Well, you've never been to a real rancho, I take it. You see Roadrunners all over the place over, in, over by McDonald's. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> not by Kentucky Fried Chicken. They don't want to be mistaken. No, I know, really. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe, well, we won't go there. Uh, so, Ruby, are we going to get to see that pot sometime after it's finished and fired uh, and ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Now you just do that Roadrunner for memory? Yeah. Or did you draw them in? I just um, did the body and then I started putting the tail and mm -hmm. stuff on. All those other parts. Yeah. All those other body parts. Well, we're going to finish up here pretty soon, like in yeah. another 10 minutes or so. So if you could have the whole thing painted in the next 10 oh, minutes, okay. that would be really good. <laughs> so what did you and Al talk about? Oh, everything. Everything? Everything. I think your number one assistant is in the back eating carrots. Oh, really? That dog loves carrots <laughs> more than anything in the world. <laughs> well, I'm sure glad to, that you agreed to do this. Uh huh. And to, this you know, to be our first guinea pig. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we've been having um, troubles with Zoom and and Google all, all day today.
Oh, you guys want carrots? Come on. Oh, <laughs> not my finger. Oh. I need my finger to paint with. We you thought... want to eat my finger. Well, how will we know <laughs> it's your finger, Ruby, if there's no fingerprint? <laughs> What kind of assistant bites? I know. You know? It's, it's the finger of the artist. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway. Okay. So yeah, are you I ready get, to call get to it? See Boston. Boston. Yeah, let's call it, you guys. Yeah, okay. Let, yeah, why don't, when, you know, when you're cleaning things up, maybe you can tell everyone what it is you have in each one of your containers. and, and uh -huh. uh, and what you're doing here. Okay. Well, it sure was fun. We got yeah. to see the pot being made from beginning almost till end. And of course, we can't do the firing here. As I said before, the upstairs neighbors wouldn't think it's such a good idea. Yeah, to really. A fire in the middle of the gallery. And they're all your sophisticated tools there, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Don't forget your uh, your kitchen knife and your uh -huh. butter knife and your pizza pan. Hey, if I ever get hungry, I'm equipped. I've got a yeah. butter knife, a spoon. You yeah, have a spoon, <laughs> a knife, and a pizza pan. What more could anyone yeah. ask for? saving all the paint. Yeah. Oh yeah, every little scrap, I'm sure. It's oh so hard, yeah. It's so hard to make. I mean, that little bit you have there is probably a whole plant. Yep. Now, does that wild spinach, that beeweed, does that grow along the river? Uh, it grows like pretty much every place out kind of like in like the desert kind of uh -huh. area. I know um, in back of Hamas, there's like um, real sandy areas. It grows back there. Mm -hmm. So I like to go back there. Yeah, the other, the spinach that we eat, uh -huh. uh, like sandy soil also. Yeah. Well, actually, you can eat that wild spinach, too. Yeah? Because we grew up with that wild spinach. We used to eat a lot of it. Maybe that's why we, weren't, we were never really that sick. Yeah. You know? Because we, we would eat the wild spinach and, you know, a lot of um, the plants that were wild. Yeah. Well, it was interesting because a friend of mine came over oh a couple weeks ago and she brought with her um, a gal who's a forager and um, a botanist basic basically but what she looks for are wild edible plants uh -huh. and we walked down the road by my house and we ate probably 10 different things that I had absolutely, that all looked like weeds to me. Uh -huh. uh, until she started pointing everything out and, and saying, this is what you use this for, and this one's really salty, and you know, this one is really good if you want to, you know, something to put, you know, yeah. like something that has a little salt in it. Uh -huh. And even to put it on meat, you can just use that plant uh, at home. And uh, there's a little nature preserve down the, the yeah. road for me. And when we went in there, uh, there were all kinds of um, little berries and seeds from various plants uh, yeah. that were all edible. So I got to try a little bit of everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know I know how to file, find wild onions. Yeah. Because when we were out helping my grandpa with um, the sheep, he would show us where to find them and uh -huh. everything like that. So I still know how to find wild onions. Yeah. And um, and they were saying, you know, like how they were saying that there was going to be a shortage of food because of this pandemic. I said, you know what? 
an Indian's never gonna starve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though we run out of meat, we yeah. know how to go get meat. There I'll just, go. There I'll go. just go, go just have my husband go shoot a deer or an elk or something. Yeah, just go find something that's yeah. running, running really it. slow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Chase him down. Yeah, even, um, what to call it, um, my, um, up where I take care of the storage units, I've been eyeing those quails up there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I say, well, oh, I'm yeah. sure we can find a recipe for them online. Oh, yeah. Actually, uh, my husband went hunting for quails yeah. that one time, and yeah. he brought a couple of them home. And um, I didn't know how to cook them, so I put them in the slow cooker. Oh my God! <laughs> Did you take it the feathers was, off? Huh? Did you take the feathers off? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. I, I don't think then <laughs> feathers tenderize in a slow cooker, no matter how well, long. Well, anyway, them. Um, I put them in the slow cooker. Yeah. Oh my God, that meat was so wow. tender, like buttery, yeah. tender, you know. Well, Ruby, thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for everything, for your presence and for all the wonderful things that you've taught us and for your skill and your artistic ability. And we are just absolutely thrilled that you came here and joined us. And believe it or not, this video is going to be uh, on our... Um, uh, it's going to be on, Derek. It's going to be on YouTube. 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 Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We're going to have our own little channel, and we're going to have all of them. So in case anyone wants to see us giggling yeah. again, they can tune in. Oh, OK. And, uh, but that's not going to happen until after September, while, so that we can do a little bit of editing. And, yeah. Uh, especially when the dog is chewing on your finger. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much for meeting. Uh -huh. Really appreciate you being here. It was really quite awesome. And